Welcome to U-Turn Review and Thoughts. Yeah, let's see. So, I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is fairly comparatively short. To see how short, check the time codes in the description box. I start this video with a review with either with zero spoilers or if I spoil anything, I will hold up an index, I'll, I'll warn verbally before doing it, hold up an index finger so you can mute, you know, mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger and yeah, then, then no spoilers and that goes for whether I'm spoiling this or something else and if I spoil something else, I'll let you know what it would be that I'm spoiling. But as soon as I end the review itself, the rest of the video will have spoilers including the ending. If you find it very important for your enjoyment of a movie that there are characters that you can really empathize with rather than just different degrees of all really awful people, or if, you know, for it to have a moral for it to not depict stuff that you really shouldn't do in real life, then this is not a movie for you. And I don't blame you, I'm just saying this is not a movie you're going to like. And most there might be times where you think a character might be easy to empathize with, but you just don't know how bad they are yet. I mean, technically, okay, there's maybe a few characters that, but no character that you spend very long with remains easy to empathize with. Now, plot. A man deep in debt due to gambling has his car break down in a small town. Now, he, yeah, he manages to get his car to the nearby small town of Superior, Arizona, or a Z. Arizona is the only state in the U.S. where you can go through A through Z, and Superior is not the only one where the Welcome to Town sign should come with a warning may contain nuts. He's trying desperately to get back out from from very early on getting into the town. He runs into every kind of trouble conceivable there. Half, at least half the people he meets cause problems for him, and. Let's see, so the given that he has the this debt, he you know he finds that he might be able to quickly get you know money, yeah, the, the money that he has to pay back soon. But the way he might make the money is perhaps not the most legal, ethical. Yeah. And he finds that it's a lot more difficult to get out of there than one might think. Now, if you've never heard of U-Turn, it's a crime drama thriller from 1997, directed by Oliver Stone, and it's basically like a noir movie adapting the concept of Murphy's Law in, into, a, you know, making that law into a movie. And I haven't watched Red Rock West. It sounds like the plots are very similar, as many say. Personally, it doesn't really bother me. I don't think that there's something inherently wrong with multiple movies using very similar concepts. I have heard that Red Rock West doesn't have Oliver Stone's traits as a director, and a lot of people have said that they like that movie much more than this. I'm not going to make a um, defense of Oliver Stone as a director like overall because I really don't. I've seen several of his movies but I do not remember. It's been so many years for most of them. For almost all of the ones I've seen of him by him from him. But I do think that his director like his his little his personality as a director works really well in this and I don't know, maybe I'll watch Red Rock West. The, yeah. The, the other one. Red Rock West, there we go. And maybe I will ultimately find that that's way better. And as far as I understand, Red Rock West came first, so I can understand why people call this a, a knockoff. You know, I, 
I have a hard time believing that I'll ever not love this movie, but, you know, I, I can understand why some people feel this, you know. I, I forget, um, I don't think, I don't think it's as important who was first if someone who did it later did it much better. And again, I'm not saying that that's the case here. I have no idea. I'm just saying I don't have a problem with more than one movie with a very similar concept. Now, this movie is kind of what a lot of city people in America think small towns are like. It's an extreme vision of that, very Twilight zone and I can understand why some people would feel that that's just incredibly offensive and I mean it, it is you know this is this is an, a movie that takes substantial delight in offending the viewer you know it's 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 like if crank wasn't so hypercharged I guess yeah it's they're they're, they're trying to get you know so I'm, I'm not saying that look if 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 it bothers you, I'm not saying you're wrong. But it is definitely, you know, personally, I every so often do. I, I don't like all of these movies, but if they, yeah, just, I, I, among other things, I love the energy of these movies. You know, this and the Crank movies, just the way that they're so, it's, it's kind of like the movie version of like a teenager doing something stupid and reckless to impress his friends you know but it, it's just like it, it's either you're either gonna be like no, no don't do it. oh you idiot I can't believe you just did that or you're gonna be like this is a blast you know so yeah this movie is definitely not for everyone a really huge thing is that Plot development in this movie tends to be a setback rather than progress being made. And to some people, that means that the film feels like it's not going anywhere. And it's taking forever in not going anywhere. And you're not wrong, if that's how you feel. But to me and others, we feel that the tension of the situation, you know, I personally love it. I, I, I can think of many times in my life where I felt like no matter what I did I was still stuck in that little and the people around me were like isn't it a great day the sun is out ah it's amazing you know and I'm just like can we please just move on so it just but but yeah I understand why it's frustrating to some people and I'm not saying you know there are other reasons not to like the movie maybe you don't find it frustrating but you still don't like the movie. I'm not trying to... If you don't like this movie, I'm not trying to, like, convince you otherwise. I'm just making my case for why I love the movie. And maybe it'll change your mind. Maybe it won't. You know, I'm, I'm not... It doesn't bother me that a lot of people don't like the movie. Now... Yeah, so, well, then, you know, neither of these are right or wrong. Although I do acknowledge, you know... Whether you find it frustrating that it's not going anywhere, or whether you just get really into the, the tension and the fact that nothing is that, you know, the fact that he's just stuck, it just, it, yeah. I do acknowledge it's probably more right to think that the movie should have progress instead of constant setbacks. I, I personally love it, and, you know, it's perhaps reminiscent of Prison Break episodes, like, and you know, problems will come up very suddenly, and they'll have to be resolved by the protagonist, and then new problems will come up. I love it in this movie. I love it on Prison Break. Now, and, you know, when you look at negative reviews of this, a lot of them... Uh, one second, what does that say? Yeah, a lot of a lot of people say that. Yeah, right. Okay, I'm sorry. I just realized why my note. I I think this is a little funny. Okay, so what I, you know, when you look at negative reviews, a lot of them point to 
the fact that there's no progress being made. So I voice type these notes using, uh, you know, Google, one second, Google Docs, I guess is the software, because the Google Drive is where I keep it. Yeah, I think. And once again, you know, it's incredible. It, you know, if I, if I didn't have it, I don't know what I would, I would go nuts because my wrists are still recovering from carpal tunnel. But every once in a while, it, it misunderstands what I'm trying to say. So when I said into the microphone, point 0.2, it thought that I meant 0 0.2, as in the, the like, you know, like, like, hypothet like if I was talking about millions of dollars, you know, 0 0.2 million dollars or something, you know. So, yeah. It's, it's always, it's always fun to see these kinds of things. Anyway. But yeah, you know, some say the plot isn't moving at all. Others say they find it frustrating that the movie is about a-hole people being a-holes to each other. Once again, if that's, if you don't like that, if that's something that really bothers you, this is not going to be a movie for you. And I don't blame you. There are definitely movies. What was that one by Stephen Sommers? Deep something? I don't think it was Deep Blue Sea. Was it Deep Rising? Rolling in the Deep? Deep Thoughts? Deep Hurting? I don't remember what it's called. But it's got like Famke Janssen, I want to say. And it's like on this, on this ship. And several of the characters in that movie are just obnoxious a-holes. And they're just being obnoxious a-holes. And I couldn't stand that movie, so I don't blame you. But I, I think what the movie isn't made for you. And that's not, you know, I don't think every, every movie, not every movie needs to be made for a huge audience. I was about to say made for everyone. If you, may, if you set out to satisfy everyone, you will end up satisfying no one. So that's a... You know, it's a bad idea to try to satisfy everyone, but this is movie. This is a movie that probably isn't for that large of a chunk of the audience. I mean, Oliver Stone said that he wanted to make a movie that he would have liked to see as a teenager, and I think he. I mean, I don't know what he was like as a teenager, but I think he succeeded. I didn't watch when I first watched this. I don't think I was still a teenager, but. You know what? Actually, thinking about it, I might have been. Anyway, the teenager in me, the 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 teenager of myself, still inside of me. I'm not saying that I ate a teenager. Really loves this movie, and I'm yeah, I'm not saying that it's as good as movies that are made for a more mainstream audience, made trying to be good movies first and foremost, rather than more entertaining, but. You know, if, if this is the kind of thing you like, it's a really great example of that, basically. You know, it's, I, I don't think that, there, there are plenty of movies that are made that aren't supposed to satisfy that huge of junk, but they're not that well made, so you end up not enjoying them that much. But this one is really, you know, if you like the fact that, you know, our protagonist Bobby keeps, you know, run running into a wall like he everywhere he turns there's a new thing preventing him from leaving town if if you like that kind of thing you're probably gonna love the movie you know now let's see the movie does a really good job of coming up with many different things that can go wrong without feeling really repetitive about it and And yeah, I mean, ultimately, we do kind of sympathize with the people and their really messed up situation. Now, this was directed. Yeah, this was both written and. Wait. Was this written by him? I don't think that. Sorry. I'm not sure if he did, but he. Sorry. These are the movies of his that I know, that I've seen at, at least once. First, the ones he wrote and directed. Alexander, Nixon, Natural Born Killers. And before you ask, I almost definitely will not review Natural Born Killers. I simply do not have enough knowledge. 
about American media obsession with serial killers, which is one of the major things that movie is about. And I just, I wouldn't be able to cover it in, in any kind of, of decent, I, before I watched that movie, I didn't even know there was an American media obsession with serial killers. But, you know, since I've looked into it and it's like, oh yeah, I guess, yeah, they do kind of, you know, the, the, there's way too much attention paid to serial killers in America with, you know, and, but, but I don't, it's, it's not something I know anywhere near enough about. And, you know, honestly, I, I think this is probably going to be the only Oliver Stone movie that I'm going to review in, in this. Yeah. It's possible that it'll change, but, you know, don't don't hold your breath. But, but yeah, so, Alexander Nixon, Natural Born Killers, JFK, Born on the Fourth of July, and Platoon. I remember really loving Platoon. And I think I used to like Born on the Fourth of July, but... You know, now I do know a little bit more, you know, I watched the the Renegade Cut video where he talks about the Rambo movies and how they, you know, it's basically American media trying to resolve the, the you know, the, the Vietnam War, trying to come to terms with it, and he... He talks about some of the things that those movies claim happened to Vietnam veterans and, you know, says there's no evidence of it. And I think at least some of those things, I feel like, doesn't Born on the Fourth of July, doesn't it have, like, people hating returning, Viet like, like, Vietnam veterans? And I think that was one of the things he says. There's no documented cases of that. So that's really, but that's, you know, if you... Oliver Stone, you're going to have to, you know, I, I, and that's the appeal for some people, for some of his fans. They love the, the conspiracy theories and, and such, but I'm really not a fan. But yeah, so movies he wrote, didn't direct, that I've watched, Year of the Dragon, Scarface. I think I will do a video on, on possibly both Scarface movies. Scar Scarfaces? Scar's face. And Conan the Barbarian. I forgot he wrote that. But yeah, that's yeah. He He wrote the crap out of that one. That's a that's a really well written movie. The first one, the first Conan movie. I remember the second one with Arnie being terrible and I haven't watched the the most recent you know, the, the Cal Drogo one. Sorry, the Aquaman one. But the, the, anyway, and yeah, sorry, this is written by John Ridley, who adapted his own book, Stray Dogs, and he also wrote the story for Three Kings. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry, I really don't have much of a comparison for if this is him doing a great job writing or, you know, and apparently, originally the movie was supposed to be called Stray Dogs, but there's like, was it a Kurosawa, Akira Kurosawa movie called Stray Dog? And, like, someone felt it infringed on copyright. I suppose if you, if you watched an Akira Kurosawa movie, and then you heard, you know, named Stray Dog, and then you heard there's a movie out there called Stray Dogs, you might think they went the alien, aliens, Anaconda, Anacondas route, and you know, made it plural for the for the sequel. And I could understand going from a, a Kyo Kurosawa movie to this would probably be confused. Yet very funny. You can't tell me that it wouldn't be kind of funny, someone sitting down watch. I mean, I would hope they didn't waste money on it, and they realized it quickly so they don't waste time on it. But it is a little funny to think about someone, yeah. Now, the, this movie has a ton of twists, but they're not the kind of twists that are at all difficult to follow. I mean, it. I guess you could say that mostly it's like there, there are a bunch of subplots, and they'll dip in and out of the movie, and you never really know when a subplot 
is going to start or dip back into the movie and yeah but but there's you know it it's not difficult to follow and it is the kind of thing where like any one of these subplots could be their own movie like these are entertaining enough characters you know but the the i i and and that again that's something that bothers you know some people feel like you shouldn't make a subplot of something that could be a whole movie but i think it's kind of awesome and i honestly i would love for like not a sequel but a spiritual successor where like not these exact same subplots, but like, hypothetically, a spiritual successor to this movie that expands on a plot that is very similar to one or more of the subplots in this. Bonus points, if they could work in this, the plot of this movie as a subplot, that would be really... I, th I think it would be great to have like an entire series of movies like this where it's just this time I mean at the end of the day it's actually the main plot is excuse me you you could sum it up real quick I'm, I'm not gonna be spoiling excuse me I'm not gonna spoil it at this point in the, this video now until we get to the spoiler section but yeah you know it's 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 mostly the subplots that that make it more you know Honestly, you could you could make a short film if if you tried to make, you know, to to do like a um, another like yeah a remake. Let's say you wanted to make a remake of this movie, and you cut out the subplots. It could be a a short film. It could be a music video, you know. And I don't know. I kind of love that about it. Like it literally is just the just if you could just get out of town you know but things keep going wrong now I'm not sure Oliver Stone has particularly made other movies that are all that similar to this but I really wish that he would I would very happily watch them I guess I should yeah I could really quickly say all the ones I mentioned having watched that he directed I remember liking them when I first watched them. I just don't remember the details. I haven't watched them in many, many years. And Natural Born Killers, I rewatched months ago. I think it was because I wanted to have it rewatched. Well, let's see. It was probably. Zombieland 2. Because it's one of the only movies I own with Woody Harrelson. So, yeah. Now, this... Yeah, so this movie... In, you know, one of the things that really works is that... You know, I, th I think it was also that Oliver Stone himself chose. You know, but sometimes directors get assigned to certain movies. But, yeah, the director gets what, what this... You know, what you can do with this kind of story. It gets a really good balance between the story progressing and all the massive setbacks. And for this movie, Oliver Stone is definitely trying to do something like the work of the Coen brothers and or Tarantino. And I think he does a pretty good job. I mean, I've seen some say that this movie lacks focus. And I'm not sure I've seen a Coen brothers movie or a Tarantino. I don't think I've seen a single Coen Brothers movie that lacked focus, and the only Tarantino movie I can think of that lacks focus is maybe Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but yeah. Other than Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I love every Tarantino movie that I've watched, which some may credit to the fact that I, the only one that I haven't watched is Death Proof. As far as the Coen Brothers, I think they are incredibly talented, but other than intolerable cruelty, I, I don't think I get their movies you know the the yeah i i i let's see um i can't believe i'm i'm forgetting the name uh to, let's see it's got it's got george clooney it's you know some have said it's like the odyssey 
uh, you know, an adaptation of the Odyssey. Oh, brother, where art, where art now? I already mentioned Intolerable Cruelty. Fargo. The Hudsucker Proxy. I think those are all of them. And other than Intolerable Cruelty, I just don't get it. And I'll freely, I, you know, I realize Intolerable Cruelty, it's basically a throwback to one of those, uh, what are they called again? I, I don't remember exactly what they're called, but yeah, if you know that movie, you maybe already know. You know, that's, it's the kind of comedy that they would make, I want to say in the 60s, so, you know, yeah, it's, that's why. You know, I can sit down and watch one of the ones from the 60s, I can sit down and watch Adorable Cruelty, but the other movies they've made, I can tell that they're good at what they're doing, but I don't get it, so I stop watching their movies, and... You know, I, I'm glad they're making movies because they clearly have a huge audience. There are a lot of people who really love their movies, and I can understand it. That I can understand loving them, and I, I do love Intolerable Cruelty. I fully acknowledge that it's a, there's some really messed up stuff in that movie, but yeah. Which is pro I don't think I'm going to be doing a, a video on it. There's just too many things and I don't really want to do a video where I'm just like apologizing for the bad stuff that's in there you know I didn't make the movie I'm saying apologizing for enjoying the bad stuff that's in there or enjoying it in spite of the bad things in some cases and I'm not I I don't really love the idea of sitting and talking about all the messed up things in a you know I I don't I don't love doing really negative videos anymore so anyway but yeah, overall, I am really happy that Oliver Stone and not Tarantino or the Cones directed this movie. It just would not have come out the same. Now. And, let's see. Yeah, so. <clears throat> the movie very quickly gets you you know, get you up to speed. The the opening really grabs your attention. You know, you find out immediately that he's in a hurry, he's trying to pay back his gam the gambling debt, what you know, at the end that this town means very little to anyone that doesn't live in it, and that definitely includes Bobby. And I will not give away this part of the video whether or not the ending is a downer or a happy ending or anywhere in between, anywhere on the spectrum, but I love the ending, and it works perfectly, it is 100% the exact right way to end this movie, and I would say, you know, you'll, you'll get very far into the movie before you realize exactly, you might guess what the ending is, but I, I would say it doesn't take the sting out of the ending, it didn't to me, and I showed the movie to my father a few months ago, he also really loved it, and yeah. Now, I like to bring up in these videos if if you lose interest along the way. I would say for this movie, it depends on how you feel about the fact that it tends to have setbacks instead of progress. And also, if you feel some of the numerous subplots in the movie either annoy you with their presence or frustrate you when they dip back out of the movie, since you don't know when they're going to come back or even if they will. And honestly, yeah, I already mentioned, you know, every single subplot deserves its own entire movie. There's so much interesting stuff going on that the movie doesn't go very deeply into. And, yeah, if, that's, if that bothers you, it's going to bother you throughout the movie, I think. It's not... The movie doesn't really get better at that. It, you can tell that the movie likes doing what it's doing with that from very early on, you know. And I do, I, I do feel bad for some of the people who watched it and gave it a very negative review because it's, it's very clear when you read the reviews this was never going to be something they liked. And you know, I yeah, I I feel bad. For, I've watched movies that I thought I was going to like and then turn out to be something completely different. You know, so, yeah. I have not read the book or listened to an audiobook of it, and I don't think 
No, I, I, I think I did look. I haven't read anything else by the same author, so I don't know what this is like as an adaptation, but this is definitely a pastiche of neo-noir crime thrillers. You know, the, the protagonist has some problems that have to do with criminal activity and whether or not he can trust the people around him, and yeah. It's not a, it's not a direct, j just straight, you know, or gay for that matter. Sorry. It's just, why, why is it, anyway, it is not a straight neo-noir movie. It is a pastiche, and that's, again, something that some people really found frustrating about it. And that's, I mean, if you're not interested in the past, like, hypothetically, if you want a straight zombie movie and you sit down and watch Shaun of the Dead, yeah, it's, you're probably going to be annoyed with a bunch of stuff in it. If you want a straight, like, murder mystery action movie Hollywood thing, and you sit down and you watch Hot Fuzz, yeah, you're probably going to be frustrated, you know. If you know that you're getting a pastiche and it's what you want, you're going to love it. At least with those two movies. And personally, I love this one, but I know not everyone will. Now. Yeah, so the, the character, Sean Penn, plays Bobby Cooper. You realize from right away that he has some problems controlling his impulses. And that is something that gets him in trouble a lot. And some people will definitely find him to be too frustrating to stay through the entire movie. And for sure he is frustrating. Now, let's see. Yeah, he's, he's got a very deadpan sense of humor. And this is the kind of thing that Sean Penn can really nail. And I've, I've seen, you know, some of the reviews, they say that, you know, he's bad, even though he's usually great. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think he's just... Yeah. It's, uh, ah, what's the word? I, I love him in this, and I love him in other stuff. Though, looking him up, I was surprised by how little I had apparently seen him in. And, yeah. Jennifer Lopez plays Grace. Her character is mysterious and seductive, very femme fatale. And while Jennifer Lopez... In the things I've seen her in, she wasn't that great of an actress. She can pull off Mysterious and Seductive. And... Let's see. And Nick Nolte plays Jake. From the moment you meet him, you really can't stand him. He is very much the antagonist that we love to hate. And he is great in the role. And... Just, yeah, he is unbelievably creepy. You know, he is undeniably the creepiest presence in this, and he has serious competition for that award. And just, yeah, he's, he's, it, it's, it's the role Nick Nolte was born to play. You know, when I, when I, the first time I watched the movie, I was like, this is, this is literally perfect. Like, this is, it's, it's as if Oliver Stone grew him in a lab specifically for this. You know, it's it's insane how good he is. And you have Powers Booth as Sheriff Virgil Potter, who exudes creepiness and tension, and you get the sense that he doesn't need much of an excuse to apply force, and, you know, he can do so much with just a look. And Claire Danes plays Jenny. She's basically a Lolita type. She can immediately tell that Bobby's from the big city, and she so badly wants to leave this boring little town. So she throws herself at him. And he is not even remotely interested. And it's honestly pretty funny and intentionally so. And she does a really great job. And, and just, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's so funny. And, let's see. Yeah, and... Joaquin Phoenix as Toby N. Tucker. I don't think I'm going to give away exactly what he calls himself. It's too funny of a... Yeah. He's dating Jenny, and it enrages him to see her throw herself at Bobby. So he's desperately trying to scare Bobby away. And, you know, basically... I mean, he basically wants to fight Bobby. 
but Bobby is much older and a more experienced brawler, and he is not even remotely intimidating. And it's especially funny because Bobby doesn't even want Jenny, you know, and and like she's like throwing herself at Bobby, and he's like, "Can you just?" Can we just not? This day is already going on forever. I really don't want to deal with some overexcited teenage girl. Like, just there is no sense. And it's maybe especially funny because he clearly does want Grace. You know, so it's not that he, you know, he's not like asexual or or gay or something. No, he likes women, but he does not want Jenny. I, it's probably because she. I, I think she does say she's like sixteen. And, you know, I mean, I forget exactly, you know, Sean Penn, he must have been 30 when he did this movie, or older, and it's like, you realize you could be my daughter, right? You're, the, the age difference, can you just go away, please, you know, and, yeah. And, yeah, Toby is this typical brash youth who doesn't recognize when someone older than him has more experience than he does at certain things. And it's just, it's it's really funny to see him constantly trying to get into a fight. And I've seen some say that, you know, basically Jenny wants to get away from Toby, that he's, you know, he's, he's abusive to her. I guess I can kind of see it, but I always really felt it was more that she just, she wants out of the, the town more than away from Toby. But I, I mean, there are a couple, he does maybe get a little aggressive when talking to her at, at times, but yeah. And John Voigt plays Blind Indian, and yeah, very, very eccentric, and you know, Obviously, they should have cast an actual Native American. And Billy Bob Thornton as Daryl. I think either this or a simple plan, which is next on the on the list of movies. Either this or a simple plan are my favorite Billy Bob Thornton performances. And he 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 is incredible. You know, that's not that's not news to anyone. If you've heard his name, you know he's in, you know, like yeah, so, but, but he's, he's incredible in, in this and that. He plays the town's mechanic, and Bobby feels certain that he has no idea how to fix the, the expense, let's see if I can remember, the 64 and a half Chevy, I want to say, that, that Bobby drove in, and, yeah, it's, it's really, and he has no choice, you know, he, he specifically asks, Okay, who else can fix the car? Oh, the next person. Oh, the next place over is fifty miles away, which is kind of a long way to push your car. So, and yeah, you know, he's he's somewhat quirky, similar to how, yeah, and he's just like his face is covered in like grease, and just yeah, he's he's so wildly, powerfully unappealing, it just, yeah, and, okay, I'm gonna try it, Valerie Nikolayev plays Mr. Arcady, he's the man Bobby owes money to, and this is a man you do not want to owe money, and, You know, the, the characters are memorable, quirky, and distinct, even though there are so many of them, they all get a good amount of screen time, we don't forget any of them. And, yeah, the majority of the acting is spot on. I haven't seen any other movie that has this many different things going on and manages to not get overwhelmed by them, by any of them. Now, the DP has done a bunch of Tarantino, some other Oliver Stone. Yes, Robert Richardson did the cinematography, and yeah, the, the, 
the the way this is filmed really gets across the intense heat of the small town and the desert surrounding it and there's this hallucinogenic like thing to it which you know, I, I saw at least I, I saw someone say you know hallucinogenic if you want to be nice about it I guess you could call it arty but it is really hallucinogenic though it, it does really I've seen movies that are just trying to be artsy and this I can I guess I can see what they mean but I thought it was really obvious that it's hallucinogenic I mean he's basically he's out in this intense heat in in you know for a really long time yeah it, the, there is the yeah Yeah, and it uses rough cuts, non steady cam shots. And. Yeah, it has uh, this harsh, nauseating feel to the film. And this was edited by Hank Corwin, who also did some other Oliver Stone, and Thomas J. Nordberg, who. Huh. Alexander Scary Movie 2 and What Women Want. Anyway, the, the movie has, you know, some somewhat similar stylized sequences to Natural Born Killers, but is much less constant and aggressive than in that film. Honestly, you know, comparatively, that one goes all in and this one barely dips its toe. But, you know, different film stocks and lenses, that, that kind of thing, intercutting in a way that's maybe metaphorical and such, but, you know, it's not scenes that are happening at the same time the you know that's the the kind of traditional intercutting you know no it's it's clearly like it's it's intercutting to where it's like almost like you're you're seeing what characters are thinking about each other but unlike natural bone killers this doesn't have i don't think it has rear projection it definitely doesn't have animation and the the kind of wild lighting you know where that movie like it just there will be scenes where it's just bathed in blue light and like it's maybe effective but it's definitely really obvious like you can tell that what you're watching is you know it's it's not subtle and i'm not saying that that's a bad thing about that movie it must be intentional they can't possibly have edited it thinking that it wasn't going to be, you know, it, it, it very much, it has an effect. It has an effect. Let's go with that. I, I really, I would not know where to begin if I tried to do a video on that. Now, yeah, and, you know, arguably the movie tries a little hard, does succeed in building excuse me, an atmosphere of unbearable heat, constant new obstacles, mistrust, violence, and dirt, literal and figurative. Now, the movie does not have a lot of special effects. I'm glad. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. There's not a lot of stunts, but there are some stunts, and it's really effective stunt work. Now... And there are a number of different you know, locations and settings around the small town. Some of them, you know, clearly where poor people live, and some of them are where rich, where rich people live. There aren't action scenes as such, but they will sometimes draw out a tense moment, really putting you in the mindset of the character in danger. And sometimes what happens happens extremely quickly, but never so fast that you can't tell what happened. Or that you get a headache from trying to keep up with it. I guess maybe I shouldn't say there's no action. It's not an action movie, but there are maybe sequences that could be. And there's some psychological horror, and at times there's a sense of the supernatural, do the Native American thing. I'm not gonna lie, I can't tell if Oliver Stone. Based on this movie, I think I might have read it and forgotten it years ago, but based on this movie and Natural Born Killers, I mean, clearly he has a certain level of interest 
in Native Americans. Because they have much more of a presence than they really need to. Like, a lot of movies that could have, you know, ethnic minorities, they try to, they, yeah, they try to avoid it, you know, but both this and Natural Born Killers, there's Native Americans there, and yeah, I, I, I can't tell if he really respects them and thinks there's really something to Native American philosophy, or if he, I mean, I'm not sure it's really treated any more respectfully than much of anything else in the movie. You know, it, it is trying to rub your face in something that's really offensive and ridiculous, extreme, so, yeah. I'm not going to give away, uh, you know, let's see. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, whoever the villains is or are are a ton of fun, and their relationship with Bobby is very memorable. And the scenes are easy to follow, even though at times there are these, you know, some quick, incredibly quick and some developments and this editing that where, where you can tell this isn't happening as it's being shown. You know, this is like someone's, what someone is thinking while it's happening. And yeah, so the, the, the movie uses many upbeat songs, despite how unpleasant Bobby's situation is, so it's a great ironic effect. And, yeah, you know, the, there's, some, there's some tense music and some more kind of comic music, comical music. And, yeah, so the, the types of comedy are aggressive humor, black humor, Blue humor, cringe, deadpan, slapstick, shock, comedy, surreal, and wit. And the the timing is spot on. The material is varied and it's excellent. And yeah, so the, I would say the main genre is crime, and the main subgenre is neo noir, and this does great as both. Like, if you just want to sit down and watch a movie about someone fixing to do a bad, bad thing, yeah, this, and, yeah, so, I haven't watched that many other neo-noir, but there's definitely some similarity to classic noir, you know, film noir, and this holds up great when compared to classics like The Postman Always Rings Twice, Double Indemnity, with both of them, I'm referring to the original. I haven't watched the remakes. I'm not avoiding them. I just haven't found cheap copies. Now, there's some very disturbing, harsh violence and gore. And the s sexual material will definitely also... This is definitely not something you should see if you're not, you know, I guess... I guess I'm going to be a, a boring, square adult and say you should probably be 18 before we watch this. And some of it didn't need to be there. It kind of leaves you with a bad taste in your mouth. But it was definitely intentional. We can argue that it was a bad choice, the wrong choice, but it was definitely intentional. It wasn't accidental. And, yeah, so the, the, the violence and sexuality... Some of it is, like, n not all of it is in, in bad taste, but some of it definitely is. And some of it does serve a purpose, but definitely not all of it. And at times it can be kind of fun, even though it's happening to characters that you care about. Other times because it's cathartic. It's happening to characters we don't like. Now... The movie moves fast and always keeps you on your toes with the twists. Now, the movie is an hour and 56 minutes long, and it's worth the investment of time if you're getting into it. If you watch it and, like, 
I guess let's say 20 minutes. If you watch 20 minutes of this movie and you're not that interested in what happens next or you're even frustrated by the yeah the fact that Bobby keeps get, you know running into to things that slow him down then it's you're not going to like the rest of the movie and you should probably just stop and and you know yeah some something else yeah 20 or 30 minutes into the movie you know, it's not going to do anything to win you over that hasn't that it hasn't already done. It's just not your kind of movie. But if you're liking the movie 20 or 30 minutes in, I definitely recommend watching the entire thing. Now, yeah, and I like to go into whether a movie is generic or unique. The only unique things about it is the Oliver Stone style and the fact that it combines all of these different stories. But if you like some of the individual stories in this, there are movies out there that have that individual story as the main story for the entire movie. Now, let's see. Hmm. Let me just briefly... I promise there will not be a lot of dead air. I just have to check something. Okay, excellent. Now... If you have good taste, there are at least some things in this that will offend you. And the longer you keep watching, the more tasteless it will get. It fits in every taboo in the book. And I can understand why some people might say, you know, it's like try hard, edge lord. And I'm not sure you're wrong. I just, again, it comes down to, you know, should the movie be like that? Probably not. But if you like it, then it's really, really fun to see, you know. And yeah, I, I really, really enjoy it. Yeah. Now, I'd say the, yeah, so the best element of this is the unpredictability and how it manages to fit in all of these subplots without feeling bloated. And... Yeah, so the I, I try to get into also the worst aspect. I'm not sure there's really anything in this that I that I don't love, but I don't, I don't know. I guess if you yeah, I mean I I mentioned that I I don't think I, I wish that instead of John Voight they had actually cast a Native American. And to be fair, there are some. You know, there's at least one Native American character in this that was played by a Native. I'm I'm fairly certain that character was played by a Native American. But yeah, you know, they they could have cast Native Americans, and I think they should. But I, it's not a huge problem for me. There's no really big problem with this movie for me. But I can understand, you know, for other people, you know, the movie might feel like it's taking forever to get where it's going, or to you have to get going. That was what I meant to say. Now, I was... A, before I watched this, I was worried that... Okay, so again, I love a lot of Oliver Stone's work. Or at least I did last I watched it. But he promotes conspiracy theories, and he gets really sappy and preachy sometimes. But that doesn't really happen here. Now... Let's see. Yeah, so the, the movie exceeded my expectations, and the thing I was most looking forward to was all the problems that Bobby runs into, and the movie exceeded my expectations. I could not have guessed all the different things that goes wrong for him, that go wrong for him. And yeah, if you you know if you really love this, I you know I recommend the other two, three. I feel like I slept enough anyway. The actors, all you know, if you like an actor, if you like the performance of an actor in this, you'll probably like their other work. And 
you know, if you if you watch this and you're like, I like the the weird editing and such, but I wish there was way more of it, you might just like Natural Born Killers. Which straight up Oliver Stone has called the most expensive art movie. You know, so he, he acknowledges that he gets artsy sometimes. The movie's a lot of fun to watch. Is it good? Yes, probably not. I recommend it to those who enjoy neo-noir and pastiche. And, yeah, I would rate this nine problems in the way of leaving town out of ten. And that brings us to... Spoiler section, and let me just make a big note here. Disclaimers. The, yeah, for for the entire rest of the video, I will be spoiling this movie. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant. Quick your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice to the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Now, let's see. So, I... Yeah, so... Content warning and or trigger warning. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie. So, incest, rape, pedophilia, mutilation, and animal cruelty. I think those are all of them. Now, I do want to say I don't have a problem with violence the gore in general. The thing is one of my favorite horror movies and movies in general. I also love Cronenberg's The Fly, Videodrome, etc. And I don't have a problem with film sexuality, nudity, disturbing, and upsetting material in general. The Monster is one of my favorite movies. I probably will swear in this video. I try not to do that in when I talk about something where they don't swear, but they do swear in this. Now, I got this movie on sale, so anything negative I say in this is not out of bitterness. I just want to not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what it's adapting to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say I loved every line they put in the IMDb memorable quote section. So you could just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. I will be commenting on a few of them later in this video, in the final section. And yeah, so as usual, the IMDb more like this list. At least the ones I had watched are movies that share a director or stuff, so I don't really have anything to compare this to. I mean, overall, if you if you want my 100% brutally honest opinion, yes, The Postman Always Rings Twice and Double Indemnity are better than this, and so is The Big Sleep, which has less in common with this than, than those do. I record this as soon as I get to my computer after watching the movie. And yeah, so the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MST3K, Rick Jacks, and other jokes, especially jokes in the, the yeah, the, the very next section after this one. And the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. In the, right, I should, yeah. So the, the very next section is thoughts I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, what you like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. 
And the final section is stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MPD, and Wikipedia. Now, I... Apologies for the dead air, just skimming through stuff that I... Right, so, I definitely, I'm not 100% certain when I first watched this, but I definitely did watch it in 2011. And, yeah, since then I've watched it at least once, maybe as much as three, in addition to the one, into, to my viewing today. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. Hmm. One second. There we go. The opening does a good job of getting across the atmosphere the desert of the desert area Bob is driving through. And we briefly see buzzards eating a coyote and Bobby runs over a cat crossing the road. We get a sense through these animals that Bobby is the kind of person vicious enough to feed off of others and that he doesn't care that much about if others die. Or at least if the, you know, about cats. And, Obviously, there's a huge difference between running over a cat because you don't feel like slowing down and killing a human being for money, but it does set up that, you know, the, the death of animals doesn't bother him and he is someone who's willing to do really awful things. From right away, you can tell that there's something wrong with Daryl. I love that you realize, once you see him come, like... At first, you know, you don't see anyone, and Bobby is just yelling, you know, is anyone here? And then he goes and turns off the music, and then Daryl responds. When he rolls out from under the car that he was working on, there's no way he didn't hear Bobby. And it's like, was he going to let him leave? How many people have come in? And just thought he wasn't there and left again. Just because he didn't feel like... Like, I guess he wanted to hear the rest of the song? Just, like, dude. There is such a thing as just, like... I literally... I can't think of a single good reason for him not to respond. There's just... You can clearly hear him. There's no way he didn't hear Bobby shouting. And like honking the horn. And he just didn't, he doesn't respond until the music, and he, he doesn't say, oh, customers. He's like, who turned off my music? They just, it's such a great, like, I wouldn't leave my car with someone like that if my life depended on it, which I guess is kind of the situation Bobby is in. If he can't get, the car to, to go, yeah, he's gonna be stuck in town, so he can't pay, so he, he is basically, it is life or death for him, and, and that's the very first thing, like, immediately, he comes into town, and he has to leave, like, this car that he loves with this guy who's just, you know, I love the thing of, like, you know, he says, I think it's the radiator hose. It's it's busted. And Daryl looks at it. Your radiator hose is busted. I just said that, you know. It's just and it's like does he not understand? Does he is he not listening like intentionally? Does he not care? Just like 
he's running a business. It's important for him to make a good impression on people. You know, hypothetically, what if Bobby went into town and started telling everyone, you really don't want to want Daryl to work on your car. I was just with him. Ah, oh, dude is just, he is not all there. I, it, you know, it's just, and, and like, you almost kind of get the sense that maybe people don't come by that often. Maybe he's just kind of alone out here and it's gotten to him in a big way you know like he he almost does kind of seem like he doesn't completely pick up on everything that bobby says and does and it's just yeah and bobby says that's the difference between you and me that's the reason you live here and i'm just passing through it really didn't take very long for bobby to lose patience with daryl and be really nasty to him. I mean, Daryl is annoying, but that was really uncalled for. So right away, we can see Bobby has impulse control issues. Like, even if you want to be cynical and say that, ah, oh, you know, you shouldn't treat someone well if, if they're kind of weird. Okay, look at it from a cynical point of view. You really think he's going to do a good job with your car if you talk to, like, that's kind of a, I, that's kind of an unwritten rule, you know? You don't, you, you... You're polite when you talk to people who work on your your car and prepare your food. And even if you don't feel like being nice, the cynical reason to do that is because you don't know what they're going to do to your car or your food if you're not nice. You know. And I, I guess I should really quick say, yes, I am saying that, that you know, Daryl is kind of weird. I'm not saying he should be treated badly. I'm just, you know... I'm laughing at the fictional character who's weird. I've known people in real life who, you know, you can you can try to talk to them and it's it's kind of like, do they, do they not understand? And I feel bad for them. I feel a lot of sympathy for them, and I I've tried to help them in any way I can. But that's not you know I, yeah sorry I'm sucking all the fun out of the video, aren't I? You know, with with this kind of thing, it's just, I'm sorry, but it's funny. When it's fictional, it's, you know, and I I do realize, you know, if you if you have a lot of movies with that, where we're laughing at characters like this, it means that some people are going to treat them worse in real life, and I wish that wasn't the case, but at the same time, it's just, it's very difficult for me to not, it's just, I'm sorry, it is funny in this movie. And Bobby had a gun on him and leaves it in the trunk. And we get the sense that Daryl maybe saw it. Excuse me. And it's it's a great... Excuse me. And, you know, by the end of the movie, we know that he sold his gun. Daryl sold Bobby's gun to Jake. You know, so Jake is holding him up with his own gun. And it's just... Yeah. And the... Thinking about it, Daryl knew that Jake wanted to buy a gun. So after Bobby left, Daryl called Jake. Maybe, maybe either yeah, and maybe just probably just left a message, you know, on on his work phone or his home phone. I, I'm not sure anybody in this movie has a, a cell phone. Although '97, I guess a lot of people didn't have cell phones back then, but. That's another thing. If you made this movie today, you would really have to explain why a cell phone isn't solving a lot of problems. But anyway, let's see. Yeah, so the, the you know, and, and Daryl just maybe, I, I would say he spoke in code, but I guess he's probably too stupid for that. Like, you know, he, he probably, Jake, so I might be able to sell you a... His, um, a G U N, if you're still interested in that sort of thing. So just let me know, and in no time you'll have something to sh show your friends, and not kill people with. This is this is definitely n nothing illegal is going on in this in this phone call. Okay, bye. You know, it just. And that's, and, and Jake, you know, yeah, he, he probably has been looking for, because he's a paranoid, like, that's why he came home early, you know, he want, he knew that he would catch Grace with someone, 
And yeah, I mean, if he's par if he's so paranoid that he he keeps the the key around his neck at all times, even when having sex with Grace, of course he's the kind of person who would buy a gun. And it just yeah, it's it's really really funny. The yeah. And funny interaction between Bobby and the the blind veteran. And Bobby immediately tries to get with Grace. And that's also the kind of thing where it's just like, do you really think that there's no one, that she doesn't have a man at all? Just, it, you know, it, it's the, the, yeah, he's really not thinking about it. And I mean, he expects to leave town in a few hours. So basically, He's going to see if he can have sex with her, and then he'll probably, you know, he'll leave town. He might never talk to her again. So that's the kind of person he is, which makes it really funny that she keeps, like, pushing him away every single time that he thinks that, oh, now is going to be, you know. And Bobby meets the sheriff, and we realize later the reason he takes an interest is because he wants Grace. Actually, thinking about it, was it, was that, oh wait, yeah, because I read in the trivia that the sex scene between Grace and the sheriff was shot on the last day. It was just, you know, Oliver Stone got the idea and then they filmed it. But that, actually, yeah, that doesn't mean that they, you know, the plot twist of the sheriff working with Grace was already in the movie. It was just the, the flashback to the sex was, yeah. But yeah, so he's basically, every time he, you know, this first time he's like, oh, is this a competitor? Is she going to screw me after screwing me? And then, no, is she going to screw me over after screwing me? And then, you know, I'm going to be left with nothing. And that means that every single time that he spots Bobby, he's like, how do I intimidate this guy so he doesn't go with Grace? And and then, you know, like, when they're at the diner, it's like, if he tries to intimidate Bobby in front of everyone, that's maybe gonna, you know, that's a, that's a little bit too much of it. And, like, he doesn't, he, there's nothing he can detain Bobby on. So if he's like, I, I just want to talk to you for a little bit, you know, it's gonna be, you know, because he prop he sees Bobby and he's like, He's got a lawyer. I could be in a lot of trouble if I don't handle this right. So he keeps showing up trying to keep an eye on him. And then that last time, you know, he does straight up pull a gun on Bobby because he knows they're leaving with the money. And that's not, that's, you know, he can only play it cool for so long. And Bobby tells Grace about the, you know, he, like... He, he taught people how to play tennis. And then he says, I used to play some competitively. And the flashbacks, the flashback footage is basically calling him a liar, like pointing a finger and laughing at him by showing just how bad he is at it. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, obviously you have to have a decent sense of how to do something if you're going to try to teach other people to do it. But I do think that, you know, being, being good at teaching people to play tennis and being, like, able to play it competitively, that's, that's not the same thing, you know. So, but he's, he's trying to get with her, and he thinks, you know, she doesn't know. She, she's not going to know enough about tennis to not know that I'm, you know, but it might impress her or something. And we see the flashback of Bobby's fingers being cut off. Which I, I appreciate that they get that, that they do that so early. It really gets across the urgency. And, and, and then, you know, Grace is, you know, she says, you know, he asks, what, what is it you do? And she says, I read people's future. And then she, you know, she, she reads his future. And then, I, th I forget what he says, but maybe, he says maybe something like, you're, you seem good at that or something. 
And then she basically comes forward and takes us behind the curtain, as it were, on cold reading. That was, that was pretty funny. Like, you know, the, the, all the things she said that she saw in him, she's like, everybody knows. Everybody has some conflict. Everybody has some darkness. Everybody has something they want. You know, just, that's, that's funny. And Jake catches Bobby and Grace, and I, I will admit, I don't really understand how Bobby thought that Jake wasn't going to punch him in the face. When it, like, he seems legitimately surprised. I don't know, maybe he's surprised how hard he hit. I, I don't know. But, and, and, you know, just before Bobby leaves Jake's house, he sees what appears to be Jake and Grace, you know, reconcili reconciliating? Reconciling? re something in -ing. An accident. you got to be more careful. I know. Jake is the third person who told him, you got to be careful with this. Yeah. And when Jake asks Bobby where he's going, he says something different from what he told Grace, so we know he's lying to at least one of them. I'm not 100% certain. Was he lying to... I guess he might be lying to both of them, actually. And Jake talks to Bobby about Grace and asks, would you kill her? And, and it is this thing, like, obviously Jake is a lot creepier, a lot more gross, but Bobby isn't, like, protesting that much, you know, like, Jake, and, and Bobby is actually the one who says, women can't live with them, can't shoot them. You know, Jake at first only says, can't live with them, can't live without them. And, yeah, you know, I, I believe that it is, that, that when Bobby kills Jake, it is the first time he's killed anyone. I, I believe him on that. But it's pretty clear that he is, like, he does not think very highly of women, and he is willing to do really awful things. You know, when, whenever a man says that he's been screwed over by a lot of women, I think it's important to not victim blame, but I do think that, I'm sorry, but it is more likely... I, I, you know, I, I knew a guy some, some years back, thankfully not anymore, who said that every woman he'd met had betrayed him in some way. So he didn't trust women at all. And I don't think I ever, I, I was trying to work up the nerve to say to him, which do you think is more likely? That 50% of the human population, what is that, 3 billion people, are all deceptive? Or that you personally have met some that were deceptive. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that you are necessarily, like, I'm not saying it's your own fault. I'm not saying that you, but I just, I don't think it makes that much sense to say half of the human population, you know, or like, or like people who, you know, who've heard that some black people are dangerous, so they think all black people are dangerous. Do you really think an entire group of people, sadly some people do think that, but think about it for two seconds. It really doesn't make a lot of sense to believe that. What you should do is try to, you know, try, try to see if you can recognize a pattern. Like, is it, is it every time you try to flirt with a girl, you end up having your heart broken? Well, are you meeting the wrong girls? Are you meeting them in the wrong places, and, and they're just the kind of girl, you know, or are you telling them things that lead to a ban, you know, I'm not saying it's your own fault if you've been screwed over by other people, but it doesn't make sense to use that to think that everybody that falls into that group is, is bad. Anyway, and that's the thing, I, I really figure Bobby has just met the wrong people, and honestly, it also seems like some of the time it was his own fault. 
and Jake realizes he's not going to be able to talk Bobby into it, at least not right now. And he claims he was just joking by asking. Excuse me. I wonder if there is like a fan edit of this movie that cuts out. I mean, let's see. Basically, you know, obviously you have to have the various scenes with that that involve Grace and Jake. You can't really Yeah, you you would you would need their scenes. Maybe the sheriff scenes, maybe not. I'm not entirely sure. But but yeah, you know, it it would make for a shorter movie, obviously. And uh, right, I I meant to, but then I forgot to to note it. I read some people really thought that the you know ah crap, I should have put that in the non spoiler section. I don't think the movie's over long, but I understand people who do, and I don't think that I I personally kind of love that there at the end the sheriff comes out of nowhere and he's like, we were working together, and and Bobby's like, is everybody fucking everybody in this town? And it's just like, I, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was amazing. But after all of that, you know, so she was trying to, she was with Jake in the hopes that he would, that that would eventually pay off. She's had sex with the sheriff in the hopes that they'd be able to run off together. And, and he, he wanted to start a sporting goods store in Minnesota or something, something like that. It's, I'm sorry, that's just a funny lifelong dream to have that it's yeah anyway and she's with bobby in order to get him to kill i guess did she also want oh that's right yes yeah, sorry i think they did say she wanted the sheriff to kill jake and he was trying to work up the nerve to do it and she said i i can't wait for you to get your act to you know, to get around or something like that. And Bobby has trouble communicating with the grocery clerk. Again, I'm sorry, it's it's just kind of funny. And I've forgotten they they really don't let the bit that let that bit breathe at all. Like he walks in and you know, he starts talking and then she says, like, No, 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 Abla, slowly, please. And he's like, uh, so, something to, to drink. Oh, something to eat, and then immediately the robbery starts. So, I, I, I kind of was like, oh, they're gonna do. It's gonna be a sitcom bit now. It's gonna go back and forth over and over. But no. And one of the robbers gets angry with the clerk, and then with Bobby. And is this all you got? I have kids to put through school, and it's like, I mean that. It just, it makes it so comical that that's literally, you know, it's not that he's some, he, he doesn't want to get rich and then leave town or something. No, he's got kids. To, you're not wearing, you're not covering your face. And you're robbing a place with a gun. You pointed a gun at a clerk. You're going to get caught and your kid is going to have more trouble getting through school. Yeah. I would say this guy was one of the people who stormed the Capitol, but he does get shot by the end of the scene, so presumably not. The, the Yeah, yeah, the... Sorry, Trump can't raise the dead. He can control the brain dead, but not the living dead. Now, the... Let's see... Yeah, so the, the robber... You know... I'm sorry, but it's kind of funny. Like, you know, he, he wants more money than there, there was, so... He talks to Bobby, you know, what, what have you gotten? Bobby's like, oh, okay, wallet, you know, mm, this is more like it. What's in the bag? Books. I like to read. Hand it over. It's really kind of personal. You know, he, he keeps trying to get out and, you know, and, and eventually Bobby gives up the, the yeah, the, the bag of money. And then the robber steals the clerk's ring, and it's my read that that's why he shoots her. You know, if she... Sorry? That's why she shoots him, sorry. 
it, it's because he that's it's personal to her she's not gonna let him leave with her wedding ring you know and the you know when she shoots him in the back the money is destroyed as well and and then he's like trying to trying to leave and he's like uh, look, no, no police, no police. Uh, uh here. One hundred dollars, no police. <laughs> she wants more than a hundred dollars to not call the police. <laughs> Cause she's like, I mean, I want to call the police. You don't. You have a lot of money here. I'm just saying I I would I would really like to call the police like two hundred dollars worth of really would like to call the police. It just this is this is really funny how we, and and it's just all these like within just in so few seconds it goes you know he just he walks in there if he hadn't walked in there the money might have been fine you know uh, I I mean. Obviously, they wouldn't have been able to take the money from him in there if he wasn't in there. But what I'm saying is, they, he and they might not have run come across each other. But because he was in there, he wanted something. He just he wanted something to drink. That's all he wanted, you know. And because of that, now all the money is gone. And you know he and he has, you know he basically, I suppose he could have left. He could have. Well, let's see. I guess could he have taken more of the money, or would it not have made sense? I mean, he he wants to get out of there as quickly as possible, and if someone sees him leave, and he has money, they might take it from. I guess it's something like that. And Bobby almost drinks water from the tap, but there's this. Tiny, I guess a baby scorpion, or is it a different kind, different breed of scorpion? I don't know. This might be my favorite instance in the entire movie of him not getting to drink. Like it's just you know you see the the tab and he's like, okay, and it's, you know he leans in under and you see the tiny little thing. Ah! Just that's funny. I'm sorry, that is really really funny to me, and I have got to stop apologizing. I I did that last time as well. Anyway, or was it the time before? I don't remember. That's just, that's really funny, and and you see, you know, and it, you know, some people might be like, why would there be a? But you see it, you see, it, like reaching in and like, it needs to have something to drink as well, and it's the desert, so there's not a lot of like, you know, it's not like it just rains, so you can just walk over and like drink from a puddle. No, it need, you know, it could tell. Oh, that there's, there's a leaky faucet there. It's you know, dripping out a little bit. And it slowly crawled up and and got on the underside and it's like I'm sorry that's just that's just really really funny to me that he almost like he could have gotten a scorpion he could have accidentally you know like if he yeah if he had like turned up so so that there was a lot of water he might have you know gotten the scorpion into his oh that's awful that's I'm sorry that. I gotta stop apologizing. Really, really funny to me. One of the funniest things in the movie. The the entire robbery is also incredibly funny. And Bobby gets back to Daryl, and we see he's taken apart the car, and it's like, why would you do that? And and he's like, you know, the and and he's talking about the the blown gasket. And I have a reputation to uphold. It's just yeah. And Daryl throws Bobby's words back in his face, but you know that's why I'm living here, and you're just passing through. Which is also like he must think that's being clever. It's not. You still sound like the the less like basically what Bobby was saying is you live in a really lame little town. You can't get out of this small town. Because you're not smart. I don't, I'm not stuck in the town where I grew up in because I am smart. And then later, you know, Daryl says, you know, that's, that's why I live here and you're just passing through. But that, 
That still makes you sound like the stupid one. Because he's that, just he doesn't get it. He doesn't, he just understands that that's an insult. So he figures that if he says it back to him, now you're the one who's just passive weight. And Bobby tries to pay, the, he's like, okay, this watch is worth $7,800. You can sell that and that'll pay for the 200, sorry, $200, not thousand. And he's like, there aren't any numbers on this. I know. That's why it's expensive, which is all. There is at least a little bit of like Oliver Stone, like making fun of like. Did Oliver Stone grow up in a small town? Because he's there, are, or, or I guess it's maybe maybe it was in the the script by uh, John Ridley, so maybe he was. But it's like you know, I know there are no, no you know, I realize that the watch is less useful than a less expensive watch. People pay a lot of money for a less useful watch, you know, and you've got the, the him falling for the cold. It seems like he, he, I don't know, I guess he was just playing along because he wanted to grace, but just the, um, yeah, I guess one of the things would be Bobby trying to get with grace, even though he's only going to be in town for a few hours, you know, I realize that there are some women who would be completely happy with that, but it does still, like, when you hear him on the phone with uh, several, you know, with, with various women that he is asking for a favor of, you can tell he screwed them over. You know, he is not a good person. He's, he's kind of an asshole. And, yeah, you know, so he is, it, it is this thing of, like, you may not have been if you've lived in a small town, maybe you haven't met a Bobby. But if you've lived in a big city, you've probably met a Bobby. He's been, like, you know, loudly talking on his cell phone behind you in line for Starbucks. Or, like, you know, hitting on the barista. Or you know, he's, he's an asshole who behaves like an asshole because he can usually get away with being an asshole. And suddenly he finds he's in a situation where it just he can't get out of the situation as long as he keeps being an asshole. And he can't stop being an asshole because it's so fundamental to his character. And it's just, yeah. I, th I think if the movie, if, the if Bobby was a great person, I think it wouldn't have worked as well. I think we would have been too frustrated watching him be you know ha having all these problems with the locals but because he's such an asshole you know i i will say we do some of the time we we empathize with him sympathize with him but ultimately you know i guess you could say maybe he doesn't deserve quite as bad treatment as he gets in superior but he he's an asshole he treats others badly he deserves to be treated badly himself he's just not used to have it happening you know, because he's used to being in control. He, you know, I mean, yes, he did, like, ah, what's it called? He, you know, he ended up, you know, in debt. So that does mean that he spent money and he ran out of money. But now he has money. You know, the the do they never do say? I guess it's from gambling that he. Or wait, was, did he lose money gambling? Did he get money gambling? I'm not... It, I mean, ultimately, we never do find out what the where the original money is from. But he did have a gun. And he did have... I forget how, how much money, but it was... It was a lot. So, yeah. You know, he... Yeah. You know, Jake punching him in the face, there's probably a lot of times where he's, you know, been with someone who he shouldn't have been with, but it didn't lead to him, it didn't lead to much consequence for him. And I, I really, you know, Daryl was like, I got the, you know, this watch costs almost nothing, and 
you know, it's got numbers, it's got all these kinds of doodads. I'll, I'll stick with this one. And that also, like, he didn't say keep the watch, he said sell the watch. You know, although I guess it's possible that the, he wouldn't be able to find someone in town who would give very much money for that watch. But it's like, there's no one who would give at least $200 for that watch? Just, like, even Jake? Jake seems like he probably knows what is worth spending a lot of money on, you know? But, yeah. And Bobby calls a ton of different people, and we see just how many bridges he's burned. Even his mother won't help. And he ends up calling Collect to the Russian mobster. I'm sorry, it is really funny. Like, he, he goes, Mom, it's Bobby. I don't have a son. My my son is dead. No, I'm I'm right. You're dead to me. <laughs> and she hangs up on him. I think she like she. You're dead to me. Clink. You know. Hanging up now. Sound just. How bad of a son do you have to be, for your mother to disown you? Like she doesn't even stop and say, I haven't heard you. I haven't heard from you for like seven years, and now you want to call. How big trouble are you in? No, it's just, you're dead to me. Bye. That is, yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry. I have a hard time understanding how people can hate this movie. It's just, it's too funny. It's just, he keeps calling people and everyone is like, oh, Bobby, yeah, the asshole. I remember you. I can't believe you're actually calling me. And, yeah, so he's talking to the, the mobster, and he accounts for why he doesn't have the money. And the mobster clearly doesn't believe, which I suppose might be the filmmakers copping to how far out this concept sounds. Not that I have a problem with it. I love it for that. But just, like, he's, okay, I'm sorry, but this this is going to sound really out there. But, um, hmm, I, my, my car broke down? Which, I mean, it, he might as well be saying, my dog ate the money. You know, just, okay, so, um... I went into a diner. Oh, right, real quick. I know I'm touching my face. I've washed my hands since the last time I was out. I'll wash them carefully again. Don't worry. I am careful about Corona. I went into a diner. I just wanted to get something to drink, you know. And there was there was a robbery. Oh, so so the robber took him right now. I he he took the money, but then the old woman running the Grocery, you know, the the diet, you know, the, the place shot him with a shot, an, an old woman with a shotgun. Yeah, I, I know, I know, it sounds kind of ridiculous. And Arcady tells Bobby just how bad the situation is, and Bobby actually responds, Fuck you! And Arcady's like, Did you just tell me? No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's so bad at controlling his temper. Just, and it keeps getting him into trouble. And a waitress named Flo. Christ. I, I really kind of love, you know, I mean, in general, she's, she's really funny. And just, you know, she can take it or fucking leave it. You, you can fucking take it or fucking leave it. I guess I'll fucking, t I'll, I'll fucking take it. You know, and, and when she's like, I, is it maybe when the when the pain, like she's handing him back change or something, and she's like, ah, it's a crack, can you tell, I'll do it, just the, the, she's trying to like flirt, but it comes across like she's not sure, like, Am, am I looking with the right eye here? Just the, it's, 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 I'm sorry, it's just really funny to me. And Bobby interrupts Jenny, so she can't say, you ought to be more careful. And of course, Toby only sees the, the few seconds where Bobby is smiling at Jenny. You know, for most of the conversation, Bobby is like, can we just not, can we, can we, can you... I, I don't I don't want to talk to you. Just please go. And then eventually Jenny, you know, eventually he smiles. Just yeah. And the sheriff interrupts the fight that almost happens between Toby and Bobby. And it, it's the thing like 
Bobby, you know, he stands up and he's clearly not afraid of Toby. And Toby doesn't for a second think, maybe I bit off more than I can chew here. Just like, it's it's not that there's a huge size discrepancy, but it's just like, Bobby is clearly, you know, he, he knows that he can take this guy. And just, yeah. And Bobby attempt to steal money from the till and the cat wants revenge for him kicking it before so it jumps up on the, it just yeah excuse me and bobby doesn't get to drink the beer because you know it's like a twist top and it's you know it cuts into his hand so he drops it and the bottle smashes of course you know, it, it couldn't just drop on, on the on the ground and then he picks it up and still drinks from it. No, no, it's... And... and that is also, like, does that even happen? Like, do they make twist tops that are that bad that you have trouble twisting it? Like, that totally defeats the purpose. So I, I don't... I don't have a lot of... You know, most of most of the twist tops I know are the kind where you put it back on the bottom, not not the kind, and you know those the the kind I'm used to are definitely not sharp enough to do. But I think that is the thing that you know, some places you can buy beer and it's a twist top. I've never heard outside of this movie. I've never heard of someone actually cutting. So it is this thing of like Murphy's Law. Everything that can go wrong is going wrong. I'm not sure. Christopher Nolan who completely, who thinks that that term means something completely different. Let's see. And Bobby goes to Jake and talks about the offer and let's see. Yeah, they talk about grades and Jake claims he can't get you know, Bobby says, you know, I, I need 13000 He's Maybe I could get ten in cash. And later we find out he's got like 200000 in cash. Like, this guy doesn't just want his... Are they, are they married? It's, uh, he doesn't just want the, the woman he's with killed. He also wants to try to shortchange the chump he's going to get to do it. That's, that's wild. Who, who tries to bargain when talking to a potential hitman? It's just, it's so ridiculous. And it's just like, did he really think that Bobby would, like, he's, he's willing to say 10,000, but not 13,000? Like, it's, it's so little when compared to, to how much he has, but he's just, and especially if he's going to be able to get the, the is he, if he really is going to get 50 grand from the, the life insurance, but I guess in the long run that maybe near, near the end of the movie when they talk about Grace, I guess it is more that he just wants to get her out of the way. He, the, the fact that he can't, he feels like he can't trust her. And Jake, you know, talks Bobby through, you know, it'll look like an accident if you go out there. I wish I was like a bird. I could fly away. And Bobby creeps up behind Grace and we see just how far of a drop it is. when she, Like, she, she kicks this little rock off and it falls just crazy far. And she, like, turns to face him and then, like, trips backwards and almost falls over and he, like, catches her. And she's like tempting him to either let her fall or have sex with her, and they have sex, and and she makes him stop. And I get the sense that we're supposed to feel bad for him, but not for her. Although maybe we're supposed to feel bad for her when she tell you know, yeah, tells Bobby about how Jake treated her and her mother, and we get the sense that Jake killed her mother, but can't quite bring himself to kill her. Actually, I guess if he, if Jake would need to get her out there and then push her over, maybe he feels like the, the, yeah, ah, uh, what's it called? He feels like she wouldn't 
be willing to let him put you know put put her in that risky situation so he can't he has to get someone that she still trusts to do it and Grace and Bobby talk about getting him money and Bobby realizes Jake was lying through his teeth about how much cash he could produce and And now Grace wants Bobby to kill Jake. I had forgotten that we're, I mean, it's like 55 minutes in, like almost halfway, or around halfway through the movie before Grace tells Bobby to kill Jake. When, uh, you know, like if you read people summing up the plot, then, you know, they're saying, you know, he's, he's stuck in this town and Jake and Grace both want him to kill the other, so... Yeah, I, I can understand how if you feel like the movie's only just now starting with the plot at, you know, halfway through, yeah. And Bob makes it back to town, and he does actually get something to drink. I forgot about that. I remembered it as him not getting anything to drink the whole movie. And the blind Indian speaks basically complete nonsense when he's trying to impart supposed wisdom and I love you know Jenny comes out and she's like I want to say the phrase was bouncing around like a spider monkey was how someone described it for taken for how um I'm sorry I forget her name she was also on Lost the the she plays the teen girl in that movie and was also on Lost yeah, like just just actually look at just bouncing. It's it's ridiculous. The the yeah, and it, it is like she really does look like a teenager. And you know, I mean, she was she's from nineteen seventy nine, so she must have been. It's possible that she was seventeen when they were filming it, but by the time it came out, she must have been eighteen. So, yeah, she's playing like a sixteen year old. But yeah, you know, it it really it, a lot like a teenager. And, uh, yeah. And that's especially funny because Bobby doesn't want, like, nothing about Bobby seems to suggest that he would ever want to be with a teenage girl. You know, there's, it's clear that there's no, you know, it's it, like, Grace will only be with him if he kills Jake. Jenny wants to be with him even though he doesn't want to be with her. It just, like, you know, every woman he encounters, and, and Flo seems to want attention from him even though he doesn't want her it's just, yeah and i i you know toby comes up and he you know he's like i can't believe this i cannot believe you're still you know and and bobby's like there's nothing going on between me and jenny jenny explain to him please and jenny's like we're gonna ride off in his car i'm gonna have his love child why would you say this? <laughs> like Bobby is like, oh shoot me now! Just this, this, this is impossible. You know, just and I love it. I just the the and Toby, he's not gonna be like, is that really? I can't be. You just met him, and you and you're gonna drive off to. That doesn't sound very reasonable. I don't. You know what? I I misjudged you. She's clearly just fantasizing. He knows who she is. I I mean I would have to think that she makes this. I I guess each time that she throws herself at a stranger, he's like, I can't believe that they have this mutual attraction. You know. No. And the sheriff interrupts the fight again, and I love that he you know he talks to Toby and he's like, your mother told me that she hasn't seen you for hours now he still lives with his mother and and he says no, no no it's okay i had lunch with my mother and just wow i mean i realize that he's supposed to basically be like a teenager but it's still pretty sad to like he's he's standing there like i'm gonna defend my woman's honor and then the sheriff comes up and he's like you should go 
eat eat a nice meal with your mother, young man. Just <laughs> the the contrast there between what's about to happen and what then does happen is just so good. I mean, even some like there are some teenagers who like live with a friend of theirs. You know, it's it's especially if they're constantly getting in fights. That's yeah. Anyway, and the yeah the sheriff drinks out of a flask, and he's not even trying to hide it from Bobby. And and Jake drives up, and he's like. Have you seen my wife? I'm looking for her. What's that? Some trash? And then he drives off. And the, and the sheriff implies that he knows that Bobby is involved in the robbery and Grace disappearing. And Daryl tells Bobby that the price is now 200 and we see that Daryl has put up the sign putting the car up for sale and it's like 16000 even though, you know, if he got the money, it, you know, he, like, he had 13000 he never had, you know, like, are actually, were there more money in the bank, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, and Bobby realizes that Daryl opened the trunk and took the gun, and Bobby goes to buy a ticket out of town, and it's just, it's, it's so funny, and like, you know, he's, he's just, like, Three, three bucks short of buying the ticket and like he you know he's thinking I spent a dollar on you know I what was it the a dollar for soda for the, the blind man I gave a quarter to Jenny the jukebox and there was a dollar and and the you know the the when they're interrupting and says, I, I know, but I, I'm sorry, I can't sell you the ticket if you don't have the money, and just, and, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and briefly, he's like, I, I don't have the money, so, you know, so he starts walking up, and, and Liv Tyler was standing in line behind him, and when he walks off, she, you know, she takes a few steps, she's about to go all the way up to the, and then he walks back, and she, like, backs away, and she doesn't really say anything. And I'm thinking, she, you know, she lives in this small town. She's probably been told all her life, if a man is going to do something, especially if he's older than you, and you should let him because that's the polite thing to do. You're a, you're a, you know, you, you're, you're a, a well-behaved young lady, so don't, you know. And he walks up, and he's saying, you know, and he starts talking about... You know, he expresses his desperation, and he does end up getting the ticket. And you know, I'll I'll talk a little bit more about it in the next section. But it it is just, it's it's one of my favorite scenes. It's so funny and it's so wrong, because this poor woman, she hasn't done anything to anyone, you know. But it's, and it's maybe especially funny because like, I've taken public transportation. I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of times in my life. I used to have to take the bus to get to school. You know, in one, you know, there and back. And let's see, is it maybe, let's go with, is, are there 300 school days in a year? Let's, let's go with that. So, you know, yeah. I've had to go and buy a ticket plenty of times. I, I don't bear any ill will towards them. Anyway, I'm just saying, I've met plenty where, like, if Bobby walked up and started talking about, I just want to get out of this town, and I might, if I don't get this ticket, I might have to do something I don't want, and I don't want to do it, and people keep pushing me, and just, yeah, they would probably freak out, and it's not, I'm not laughing at them, it's just, it's such a, it really is, like, in, in that kind of thing, she, she, in part, we're laughing because it's so wrong. It's this, it's this, let's see, is it technically black humor if it doesn't involve death? But, it, you know, it's just, you can, you can see this kind of thing, you know, and, and at first she's, she's like, you know, she's trying to be, be helpful. And, you know, he walks up 
I want to get out of town. Where are you going? Out. Well, yeah, well which, which, where would you like to go? You know, um, Mexico. Oh, sure. Here's one. And you're 27.55. And, or, th th sorry, 30.55. I have 27.60. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't sell you the ticket. If you, don't, you know, she's, she's being so polite. She doesn't lose patience with him. And then suddenly he's freaking out, you know, and it's like, this poor woman and and it's also like we we already know that he's in this bad situation like he's literally saying if i can't buy this ticket and leave town you know the 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 mobster guy is going to show up and he's going to kill me if i don't have the money and the only way i'm going to be able to get the money is if i kill jake and i don't want to do that you know and so just yeah it's just it's really funny i Honestly, if they made an entire movie about Flo, the waitress, or the the woman selling bus tickets, I'd watch it. You know, they're they're likable. Anyway, yeah, they're actually yeah they're the closest the movie comes to likable. You know, basically everyone else eventually shows that there's something really really messed up about them. And. Yeah, you know, the scene at the bus, it's, you know, where, where he's trying to buy the bus ticket, the, the cameo is like, hi, Liv Tyler, bye, Liv Tyler. Is this... I, I don't personally mind. It, it. Clearly, some people lost their shit about how Liv Tyler is barely in the movie. I kind of think it's hilarious, especially, like, in case you don't know, she was actually, she had been, she had starred in movies back, you know, by 1997, let's see, she had been in... I haven't watched it myself, but was it called Empire Records, maybe? And was she in that one with Jennifer Connelly? What's it called? Where, where Which I think also had Joaquin Phoenix. Ah. Uh, finding the somethings? Discovering the somethings. Family name. Uh, yeah. You know, she had been in stuff. This was not, like, the first thing she was ever in. That would have been, you know, it's like, oh, okay, well, no. No, she, I mean, hypothetically, she could have played, like, I mean, Jenny's not that big of a role, but, and she she wouldn't really have worked as casting for Grace, but hypothetically, you know, I think she was playing the female lead in some of these movies, but by this point, you know, so it's like, and, and she's recognized, they didn't, like, I, I know some people had trouble recognizing John Voight, but I don't think there's anyone who had trouble recognizing Liv Tyler. Although some said Blinken will miss her, which is almost true. She's not only in it for original movie, but you're, you're not paying that much attention to her character. Maybe that's what they mean. But yeah, it's like she she could have gotten a starring role, and she's there for just a few seconds, and it's a thankless role too. I mean, it's not even like an in joke like how the the you know if you watch uh let me think there's two movies direct two comedies directed by john i can't believe i'm blanking on his name but yeah the director of blues brothers he directed at least two comedies and i yeah, is it a spoiler? What I'll, uh, there are these two rich characters who show up in more than one movie. And in one of the movies, they're very important. But in the other, they're basically cameos. But it is apparently supposed to be the same. And, and yeah, like the uh, Askew Universe, you know, um, Kevin Smith, not the one who used to play Ares on Xena, R.I.P., you know, yeah, some of those movies, you know, like Jane Silent Bob, I think, are cameos in some of them, and then in others, they're like the leads, you know, so it could have been that, but no, this, it's just Liv Tyler who's the stand, it just, I, I kind of love it, the, the fact that just, you know, I do think it's too bad that right after the Russian gets to town, he immediately gets arrested, and that's the last of him, I feel like it would have been you know, it would have been cool if 
excuse me. If some of the movie had been him just driving around town trying to find Bobby. But it is kind of it it is kind of funny that he's just like driving around. He's got like he's got a a, a pistol holster with a gun in it, so the sheriff immediately arrests him for that. You know, it's just like, did you really not think he he told you he was stuck in a small town? Of course you're gonna run into it just yeah. And you know, Toby knocks Bobby on the and, and isn't that another time that Bobby's trying to get a drink and he, Toby he, yeah and he, he loses it you know Toby attacks him and he sees how you know the the ah, Bobby is trying to reach for the you know like the, the 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 ticket is just just out of reach and Toby grabs him huh bus ticket I'm leaving town. You will never see me again. And Toby, instead of just like ripping up, he like eats some of it and it's just like, do you think that makes you look tough? It kind of just makes you look like an idiot. Like, it's paper. It doesn't taste good. Just like, incredible. And the... You know, obviously, Bobby is not going to just go back in there, even if she comes back from a break anytime soon. He's not going to... So, funny story. Do you know how I just freaked you out about how I need a ticket? Well, I still can't afford it. So, could you spot me another one? That would be fantastic. And I'll try to keep the psychotic breaks to a minimum. And Bobby beats up Toby and... Even punches Jenny, which is really, really uncalled for. It, you know, at most it's funny in a dark kind of way. But, you know, if, for a while he's, like, punching Toby. And she's like, oh, you're going to kill him. And then, you know, he, he leaves. And she's, like, standing over him. And, and Toby's like, I love you, Jenny. You killed him. And it's like, what are you talking? You can hear him speak. He's clearly not dead. I have to wonder if, like, some of the actors, like, when, when Stone said, okay, so you can, obviously you can tell in real life he's not dead, but I want you to shout, you killed him. If they were, like, whatever you say, dude, whatever you say, it just, uh, and Bobby calls Grace and sweet talks her to get her to agree to the plan she suggested and Jake and Grace talk after she hangs up and she looks at the key. I've seen some say the philosophy the blind Indian espouses is bullshit and criticize the movie for it. I agree that it's bullshit but I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be. I don't I don't, I don't know. Oliver Stone puts you know he, he believes in weird shit like conspiracy theories he puts in his movies but it's always read to me like He's a weird old blind guy. He wants people to listen to him, so he says weird stuff, hoping that they'll believe it. You know, I, I don't really think that... Excuse me? I don't think we're supposed to be like, wow, that's so deep. I've seen some people really dislike the fact that, you know, in the night scene, the dog is clearly shown to be alive. Even though earlier the Indian said it was, you know... I figured that earlier the Indian was lying about it being dead. It was probably just asleep, and he didn't want a stranger touching it, so he claimed that it was dead. I mean, it's not like Bobby took its pulse or something. I agree that it's weird. I agree that it maybe doesn't even make sense for him to at first claim the dog is dead. But I'm pretty sure weird and nonsense are the point of the movie. Like, you can criticize that they chose to make that, you know, part of the movie, but I really don't think it makes a lot of sense to say that the movie is just inconsistent. It's consistent about being weird nonsense when it comes to the dog. And like, if, if you say that it's a dumb joke, that's fine. But I really, I several people were like, he said the dog is, you know, the dog is dead and then suddenly it's alive. It's just, that's the joke though. I mean, when, when you think back, he didn't, he, he touched it briefly and said, I think your dog is sick. And then he said, it's dead, you know, it, yeah. And Grace unlocks the front door, and not long after, Bobby's able to get in. 
and we hear that Jake actually blames Grace for what he did to her mother, and then it seems like he's got PTSD from killing her mother. You know, I, I appreciate that there's more to his character than might think. You know, he's not, he's still utterly detestable, but yeah, there's a little bit more to him than, yeah. And, and Jake points Bobby's own gun at him, and, and Bobby realizes that's, that's my gun. Daryl sold you my gun. And Jake gets Bobby to confess to wanting to kill him for the money, but he also tells him about Grace, and even men's, like, you know, that you told me to kill her because you know that she's, she wants you dead. You know, if not me, it's going to be someone else. Are you going to shoot every man who looks at her? And 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 Bobby says, for $200, he'll kill her. Because he just wants this car so he can leave town. And Grace heard everything, so now she, of course, figures that Bobby is going to try to kill her. So she gets out the axe. And Jake hears what sounds like a struggle and runs in and thinks that Grace managed to kill Bobby. But it's a trap. And Jake pretends that Bobby just slipped past him, and Grace approaches with the axe. Let's see, Bobby attacks. Yeah, and, and together Grace and Bobby manage to kill Jake. I appreciate that it's a struggle. I, I've always... It, it feels so... Like... If you as a filmmaker don't want people to imitate the the method of murder that they see in your movie. And presumably you don't, because you're a filmmaker and not a murderer yourself. Something that makes sense is to show just how difficult it actually is in real life to kill. Like, this was something that, I guess it's technically, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. What was that movie called? Crap. I know it was a Hitchcock movie. Let's see. I no, I, I cannot recall. But the there's at least one Hitchcock movie where he shows a scene of someone killing someone, and it's actually very difficult. And yeah, you know, in real life, I thankfully never tried, never will. But in real life, it is much harder to kill someone than it, than the movies make it look. So yeah, I like when they do depict it like like how they killed Jake. It is a struggle, and it's very unpleasant. And then afterwards, the dead body is there, you know, and, and Grace, and they have sex right next to the dead body, because it's, the, the, they really, they go for every single taboo. And Grace has to make a choice between which of the two men she wants to kill. And Bobby finishes off Jake. He does feel bad, but he was still pretty quick to do it. Just like Jace, Jake said he would be. And Grace opens the safe and they count them. They, they, you know, they realize just how much money there is. And yeah, have sex very close to his dead body. And, and she's like, he can watch. And Bobby prevents the, the car from, you know, he like sabotages the car so it can't drive. And goes and gets the car from Daryl. And Bobby drives back and it looks like Grace drove off with the money. That's really messed up. And Grace clearly does know that Bobby was the one who sabotaged the Jeep. I love that the sign out of town says, You are leaving Superior, Arizona. We know you'll be back. And that's the, I mean, technically, Bobby didn't get very far. You know, in the, in the trailer, it says, he just wanted to get from here to there. But it turns out you can't get to there from here. And that's, that's, yeah, well put. That's the problem. And the sheriff pulls him over and realizes Grace was the, the sheriff as well. And Grace tells the sheriff that Bobby forced. And, you know, the, the, the gun gets put in between the, the, so when she walks out, she has a gun, and he can't tell that he's being, that she's aiming at him. And, yeah, Grace confronts the sheriff. And according to the sheriff, all the things Grace told Bob, Bobby are lies. 
and yeah, and they're driving again. And clearly, Bobby is uncomfortable with Grace having a gun. The last chunk of the movie really tests the extent of Jennifer Lopez's acting talent at the time, and I would say the majority of the time she does come across as convincing. I like the echo effect when Grace says, pop, pop, pretending to shoot Bob in the back of the, you know, she can tell that that's what he's thinking. And Bobby hits Grace in the face and gets the gun back, and briefly she laughs, I mean, crazy. And there's definitely, this is a movie that plays with the fact that a lot of white Americans think that Native Americans are crazy. And, yeah, that is legitimately, ugh. And Bobby says they're not going to stay together. And they dump the body and Grace pushes him over. It really looks like it hurts when he, he hits the rock at the bottom. Like, I felt that like you know how sometimes you know if you see something that you know staged violence i wouldn't know about i i don't watch real violence but you know yeah staged violence and you and it feels like it hits you right in your gut even though you know that it was staged and most likely no one actually got hurt it's yeah i've, I've seen someone say why didn't he wait until after they dumped the body with you know telling her they're not going to be together well, he doesn't trust her with the gun, even for, like, if he, I, I agree that, you know, he maybe should have seen coming that she was going to push him, although, think about all the heat he's been exposed to and how little he's had to drink, he's probably starting to, to really lose his, his, you know, whatever sense of judgment he used to have, you know, and, yeah, like, he feels, if, if he leaves her with the gun even briefly, she's going to shoot him. Excuse me. And Grace is about to drive off, and then she realizes Bobby still has the keys. And then we realize that he is still alive, so she goes to help him. And Bobby suggests using the tow rope, but the trunk is locked, so, he, you know, she says, so he asks for her to come down to help him. And there's that brief bit where he looks up and he can't see her. Like, what? No, you know. But in reality, she just she took a longer way where he can't see. And yeah, she reaches her at the bottom. They proclaim their love for one another, and he strangles her, and it's just really messed up. And Bobby, you know, he's like, "You're still lucky." And you know, he sees all the buzzers in the sky and he tries to drive off. And the the radiator hose explodes you know and my read is it it's not that you know i don't know enough about cars to say if it's even possible to just like patch it together you probably do have to put a new one in but i think that that daryl because he's so bad at you know he he put in a radiator hose that was you know, that was close to, to coming apart. And I don't think he even did it on purpose. I mean, you could you could argue that maybe he did it out of spite. But I think he's just that bad at this whole thing. Like, you know, it's, yeah. He's, he's... But it's just, it's really funny to me. And I understand, you know, some people hate the the ending yeah, let me just briefly get into it. There are a few other things. I would definitely say that I read the ending as Bobby slowly dying out there in the middle of nowhere. I don't think anyone's going to find him anytime soon. It's so far outside of town. He doesn't have any fluids in the car, so likely he'll die, you know, either of thirst or of heat exposure. You know, there's no way he's going to get the car to run. You know, heat exposure, heat stroke, um... I feel like there's one other, but I, yeah, the, the elements, you know, and yeah, it's way too far for him to be able to walk with his broken bones, and he has no way of contacting anyone, and I've seen some say that he shouldn't have been able to get back out, you know, after falling down. I agree, the movie is pushing it really far. I just don't think it pushes it too far. I think it goes right up against the edge, 
Like, if it... Like, let's hypothetically say that he did have to also run. Or that he, like... Or let's say somebody shot at him and he did, like, a dive into the car without all of his bones... You know, with, it, that he wasn't somehow in too much pain to do that. Then I would think it crossed the line. The way it is, I think it goes right up against the line and, and really, like... It is, like, basically staring you right in the eye and saying, yeah, he is climbing out of there with all his broken bones after falling, landing hard. That's, that's actually happening, you know, and, and just, and yeah, either you're like, fuck this movie, this is impossible, you know, that would never happen. Or you're like, this is amazing, I can't believe you're actually going, you know, you're actually going. Obviously, if you spend very much of the movie feeling like nothing is happening because there's constantly something preventing Bobby from doing what he wants to do from the plot progressing, in that case, you might especially hate the ending since basically it makes everything leading up to it completely pointless. Personally, I love the movie and the ending. I think it is an absolutely perfect way to end it. And I I wish I knew more movies that were like this. You know, if, if you have any, please put them in the comments. But yeah, I, I can't... It's just, it's, it's amazing, because really, like, I get, okay, technically, someone is going to find the money, but there's some chance, you know, so, so it's not like the money is gonna, not going to help anyone, but for most of the movie, the, what we care about is whether Bobby is going to be able to pay off the mob, or if he's going to lose all the fingers, you know. And, yeah, it is this sort of thing of, like, you know, if he hadn't, ah, what's it called? Oh, right, I forgot about that. No, yeah, never mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk more about the, the I'll, I'll get more into that in the next section, but to briefly finish off this section, yeah, the movie is an hour and 56 minutes without end credits and 59 and a half with them. That was a bit of a long section. So, yes. Notes taken before watching. I had forgotten I watched Sean. Yeah, I already mentioned. You know, I had, I had seen Sean Penn way less than I, I thought. So I'll just briefly go over the game, the thin red line. Being John Malkovich, Mystic River, The Interpreter, and What Just Happened appear to be, you know, I love him in this and I love him in Mystic River. Those are also the ones I most remember him in. <sighs> okay, so Jennifer Lopez. I saw Anaconda. Let's see. Oh, one second. Oh, yeah, that is her in Ants. Enough and Ghibli. Yes, I actually watch Ghibli. It's it's as bad as you heard and honestly probably worse. I like the movie enough, well enough, but I feel like it's it's the kind of movie where we really just, we basically just want to see her, you know, being able to get back at the husband. You know, we... He's, he's been really awful to her, including physically abusive, so we want to see her beat him. And the movie, you know, it has to stretch to, you know, feature length. So there's, I don't know, I guess not everybody would call it padding, but I kind of felt like it was padding. I was just sitting there waiting for it to finally get, you know, I'm not going to give away in this video whether or not it does end with her beating him, but that's what we want for the movie, to, you know. It's especially ridiculous when they get that the the one of the guys from ER involved and he's like I think he's playing like a friend of the husband and he's like keeping an eye on her or something. It's just why is the the problem with the movie enough is that there is not enough material for an entire movie. Yeah, the movie enough does not have enough material for a movie. The 
it's it's enough for a short movie. It should have been a music video, basically. Like, you know, you spend the first little bit of the music video showing that he's abusive towards her, then you show her training, and then the last bit of the music video, she's beating him. It's it, There's not enough there for an entire movie. And honestly, like... It's it's too bad because I it's it's obviously I I know in real life it's not it's not that if if someone if you're the if you're a survivor of physical abuse or rape it's not that it would be a, you know it's it's only in fiction that it makes it, obviously in real life for some for a survivor of physical assault and and or rape to beat up the person who assaulted or raped them, that's not like a solution. You know, it might be cathartic, but you can't, you know, but it is a movie, and so, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's obviously very satisfying to see, but there's, yeah, there is not enough material. Maybe the movie should have opened with her beating him, and then the rest of the movie should have been, like, her making, like, uh, you know, like a like a a bureau that you can contact if you've been physically assaulted or raped, and they'll help train your body so you can beat your attacker. I'd watch that. And Nick Nolte, let's see, oh that that is his voice in the movie Noah, the twenty fourteen, as Sam Samyaza. Anyway, Hotel Rwanda. Hulk, 2003, Simpatico, Thin Red Line, Mother Night. Oh, yeah. Oh, love that movie. Love him in that movie. Mulholland Falls. I love Trouble. Cape Fear. Everybody wins. Do I love Trouble? Do I, I mean, do I love I Love Trouble? I don't love Trouble. I, I mean, I love a lot of movies about Trouble. I don't think I love I Love Trouble. It's it's a perfectly charming, you know, movie. I do like Cape Fear. I know, I know, I I need to watch the original, but I do. It, it was, and it's also it's you know both both Nick Nolte and De Niro are great in it. And everybody wins, except anyone watching. And Powers Booth, so yeah, the the Sin City movies, first Avengers movie, Man of Honor, Con Air, apparently, but it says unconfirmed and uncredited voice of officer in leaving ceremony. I mean, I guess it does sound somewhat like him. Anyway. Nixon, Sudden Death. Oh, Sudden Death. I could watch that movie again. He's great in that movie. That's that's probably, if you want, if if you're like, ah, I want to watch a movie where Powers Booth is awesome, Sudden Death is, is what you're looking for. I mean, something Brad Jones occasionally brings up is the fact that in that movie, Jean-Claude Van Damme fights a bad guy who's wearing... A sports team mascot unit or costume inside of a like a, a kitchen. I realize that's not going to sell the movie for everyone. I just I don't know how to talk to you if it if you're not one of the people that that like. I didn't know that that was going to be in the movie when I first watched. You know, I watched it because it was the '90s and I was. A, Big fan of Van Damme, but yeah, the, that's that's in that movie. You know, I I don't know how you can not want to watch it at least once, at least to see that. Anyway, yeah, Tombstone, Stalingrad, Tomb Prejudice, and Claire Danes. I I've heard she's incredibly talented. The only things I've seen her in are this, Terminator Three, and Romeo and Romeo plus Juliet. I remember liking her in, in Romeo plus Juliet. And I mean, Terminator 3 is not her fault. You know, there's 
it's a terrible movie for so many reasons. She does perfectly fine. Anyway, Joaquin Phoenix, Joker, Walk the Line, Ladder 49, Zola Wanda. Yeah, there, there are several actors in this who are also together in other movies. Signs, Gladiator, 8mm, and Parenthood. And Billy Bob Thornton, The Alamo, Love Actually, Terrible Cruelty, The Man Who Wasn't There, A Simple Plan, Armageddon, On Deadly Ground. Yeah, that is him. Tombstone, Indecent Proposal. And let's see. Yeah, so John Lloyd, Zoolander, Prof, Tomb Raider, Pearl Harbor, Enemy of the State, Anaconda, Mission Impossible, Heat, and the Odessa File. Now, let's see. Yeah, so. Yeah, I right. I put this here because I remember it as being a trio. Like it's a plot twist that Grace is originally Native American. Obviously, they should have cast an actual Native American actress in the role. You know, she's she's not white, but she's not Native American. She's la Latina. I love how Bobby just continues to not be able to get a drink. Let's see if I can remember them all. I promise I won't spend forever on this. I'll I'll move on if I just excuse me. Let's see. So he goes into into town. I think the first place he tries is the the grocery store. I uh, dine. What whatever with the with the you know woman who only speaks Spanish. And so he he wants to buy something there, but then there's the robbery, and obviously he wants to get far out of it so he doesn't end up like being questioned and having to stay in town for a really long time. And not being able to pay off the debt. Let's see. He goes next time he tries to get a drink. Yeah, he goes. Yeah, he goes into the the diner or cafe place and gets a beer with a twist top, but it cuts into his hand and he drops it. He let's see. Does he buy a? I th yeah, I think the next time is he's gonna, you know, with the, with the tiny, what's it called, like a scorpion, and let's see, there's the, um, yeah, there's the time where he, I feel like there's at least one more, but right now I cannot, yeah, yeah, he, he gets a soda right before Toby attacks him when he's got the, the, the bus ticket. I disagree with those who say that Bobby is not a bad person, and I have to wonder if, in part, the you know the idea of the movie is that he's in limbo, possibly even hell. You know, let's see. Yeah, you know, that yeah, that he maybe deserves how awful what he's experiencing is. Maybe he's being tested and he fails the test, and that's why it ends with him slowly dying from heat exposure. I'm not saying I personally believe that he des does deserve what happens in the movie, but I do think it might be the idea that we're supposed to think that. I, mean, I think it's very, very clear. This is he is not a good person, and he's not like. I th I think it is kind of the the idea is supposed to be that he didn't make it out because he. And I think it would help explain all the weirdness, you know, the the kind of Twilight Zone weirdness of a lot of the movie, if you figure, well, it's, I mean, maybe half of what he's experiencing doesn't look and sound the way he's experiencing it. Maybe, like, his, his mind has started going because of all the heat. You know, I, I saw some people say, well, he's, he's running around the entire movie, he, he barely drinks anything, why doesn't he die or something? Maybe, maybe he did. Maybe what we're seeing is actually his mind trying to make sense of what is going on, you know. I th and I think, I agree that it's contrived that there's constantly something stopping him from getting out. But I think maybe if you read it as he's in hell or purgatory, 
you know, does that maybe help forgive the, the writing being contrived? Like, it is basically every single time he thinks he's making progress, you know, he's, he's pulled back down into hell. Or purgatory. One scene where I really empathize with the person that Bobby is inflicting himself upon is when he buys the bus ticket. I understand his desperation, but he really scares this poor woman, and it is darkly comical, and I don't know whether I find it really funny that after all that, after him being such an asshole to her, he doesn't get to keep the ticket, you know, or if that makes me say, well, the scene was gratuitous then, you know, it's just, it's, it's like, after all of that, he loses the ticket within, like, a minute of leaving, it's just, yeah. Now, let's see, yeah, so the, the, yeah, I listened to Cult of Muscle talking about this movie, and it's a little, if you go to their website, you can't do a search for movies, so you basically, basically have to find, but this was episode 184. You know, I, I found it by going to the IMDb external reviews page. It, it linked to this. So, you know, if you want to find it yourself. It was, it was a good, you know, they had interesting things to say. So, here's a few of the things they said. He's a very political filmmaker, but most... Let's see. Most of those are not that interested in style. In the 90s, he was very stylish in his films. His style is like Terry Gilliam crossed with Tony Scott. That's a really good way to put that. Yes. Terry Gilliam crossed with Tony Scott. That's... And they go on to say, I love the score by Ennio Morricone. It makes it sound like a 70s movie. Penn acts like he's in a different movie. Bobby thinks he's cool, but every man in the movie is garbage. I've forgotten the movie's mostly a comedy. They acknowledge that he's made... Sorry. They acknowledge that he's made some terrible movies and some great movies... And they say the movie's definitely too long. There's 25 minutes left after we know Howard's Booth is in on it. It should only have been five minutes. Is it really that much left? The movie is maybe exploiting small town people, but it's definitely accurate about them. Howard's Booth didn't need to be in on it. One person too many doesn't really add anything. It's a strange and episodic movie. They rated seven dead dogs out of ten and a mouthful of wooden teeth. And, yeah, so the DVD comes with the trailer, which is also on YouTube. It's really great. It really sells it. It does give away a little too much. Especially, you don't want to watch... If you watch the trailer and then you watch the movie right after, you're going to know we didn't see the radiator hose bust open at the, excuse me, at the start of the movie. The trailer makes it look like that belongs at the start of the movie, but it's actually the end of the movie. So that's literally going to spoil the fact that the hose is going to bust at the end of the movie if you watch it. So, yeah. Anyway, the, the, uh, let's see. Yeah, it does a really good job. You know, it sets up some of the, some of the stuff and, and subplot, excuse me, and does really well at that. <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, that brings us to the final section. Critic sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. Okay. Wow. I noted 230 things I want to get into. I'm going to skim and see if all of them... Okay, so... Yeah, so this is a critic. Filmmaker Oliver Stone has infused U-Turn with exactly the sort of over-the-top list and subtle vibe one might have anticipated. The best art of any age typically comes from the dysfunctional artist, and U-Turn is just that. Stone's oddball glimpse into a shadow America that no one wants to believe exists, but undoubtedly does. <clears throat> U-Turn is an overdue event, a chance for Stone to apply his hypnotic acid trip of the soul wizardry to something sexy and low down. Ah, excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, man. <clears throat> I cleared my throat before 
I started recording, I guess it's... But then I have been recording for hours by now. Let's see... It's a feast for the senses, as long as you have a strong stomach. Long, strange trip is fun, but aimless? Viewers who don't need depth and can ignore technique overkill along with social critique nonsense should enjoy the bumpy ride offered by a U-turn. Now, let's see, so... Oliver Stone proves he's no Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, I agree that there's stuff about this that you could... You know, there's definitely stuff to criticize in this. But I really don't... Th I think he does well at the, the tension and suspense. Stone has stretched this rubber band past the point where it should snap into parity, but it still holds the shape of a rubber band. Let's see. Oh, yeah, real quick, this one. U-Turn becomes a showcase for the filmmaker's terrific arsenal of visual mannerisms and free association imagery. That is very well put. That is exactly right. Free association imagery and visual mannerism. Yeah. Now, it demonstrates a filmmaker in complete command of his craft and with little control over his impulses. Stone the propagandist was insufferable, but as a cynic, he's even worse. Stone's trademark techniques, fast cuts, multiple images, mixed film stocks, odd film speeds, weird angles, overtake the film. I can see what they mean, but I, I don't think it's too much. I agree that it's almost too much. It goes right up against the edge. As far as I remember, there's much more of it and goes much further in Natural Bone Killers, but then I suppose this reviewer might either think that it works for that or that or also dislike that movie for the same reason. The movie plunges so deeply into black comedic hell, all is lost. Hmm. Now, let's see. And a lot of stuff that I'm going to skip here. Some people say that, you know, they love the, uh, what's it called? They love the cast and the people making it, but they didn't think that huh, black comedy at its most cruel. But yeah, some, some people feel like they you know they could have loved this movie but you know for the due to the cast and crew and such but they don't and they feel that the talent was wasted and I can understand what they mean. Heh. 
Oliver Stone's imaginative style runs rings around John Ridley's idiotic screenplay. For my money, a big part of a big part of what I love about this is the, the screenplay. The trouble, which becomes quickly and oppressively apparent, is that the screenplay has no point except its plot. No theme, no intent of anything like Oliver Stone Wake is ever manifested. Okay, so this person gave it a 20 out of 100. The parade of eccentrics never ends, and Stone's near miraculous achievement is to drain the life right out of material so sordid you think it couldn't help but be interesting. A must to avoid. I do enjoy reading when someone really couldn't stand. Yeah. Now. Yeah, and that brings us to IMDb, and there are three taglines, but two of them are the same, except one of them is capitalized, the first one, anyway. Expect the unexpected, and sex, murder, betrayal, everything that makes life worth living. The role of Grace was originally intended for Sharon Stone, but salary negotiations fell through. I can I can hardly believe that they thought that Sharon Stone, as a Native American, I mean, at the very, very least, Jennifer Lopez has a similar, you know, like, she's not white, but I like Sharon, I, I mean, I don't know. If she's still doing anything, but I like a lot of Sharon Stone's. Yeah, you know, I th I think she was. I know some people say that she, oh she's attractive, but that's it. And I th I think if you watch the movie Casino, she is very very good in that movie, in my opinion. I really don't think that she could. I I don't know. I guess maybe they would have browned her skin up. I mean, I did, they did kind of do that with John Voight, so I guess that was what the plan was before J-Lo was cast. Sean Penn and Oliver Stone did not get along during filming and clashed constantly. Years later, they put their differences aside and became friends. It doesn't really show in the movie. You know, sometimes that can be a real big problem if the director and star are not getting along. There we go. And... Apparently, this is loosely inspired by a true event that took place in the early 1980s where a drifter, like Sean Penn's character, passed through a remote south western road stop only to never be heard from again that is i mean it's very unlikely that they experienced even a fraction of what happens in this movie but it is still like that is a chilling they need to make a horror movie based on that like true event i guess maybe it actually yeah that is there probably is yeah i haven't seen all of them Let's see. Oliver Stone offered the leading role to Tom Cruise, who turned it down. Too much of an a-hole character, maybe? Tom Doesn't Tom Cruise tend to prefer... I know you can't. I'm thinking out loud. I'm not expecting you to somehow answer me. I feel like he's he doesn't take very many a-hole roles, with a few notable exceptions, such as Magnolia. But I could imagine. 
he does have good comedic timing, at least in some of the performances I've seen. So I think he would have been okay. But I, I just, you know, he he has to really project, and I mean, the Bobby is an asshole, and I, I'm not saying Sean Penn is in real life, but he plays that very convincingly. I'm not sure I've seen Tom Cruise be as convincing of an asshole as Sean Penn is in this. Tom Savini was supposed to play the part of the second biker after Oliver Stone saw him in From Dusk Till Dawn 1996. But due to a schedule conflict, Stone cast producer Richard Potowski in that part instead. That would have been kind of fun. I have to wonder if Stone has seen... I, I mean, I can't say which movie it is without spoiling that movie. Yeah, I guess I'll just... Some people know what I'm talking about. It's, I guess what I'm, yes, what I'll say is there is at least one other movie out there where Tom Savini plays a biker that had come out before this movie that Stone might have seen. Now, let's see. Right, so, yeah, so there's, I don't have much to say about the IMDb goofs section, but I do just want to, there's a, I don't, yeah, there's list, it's listed as a character error, I feel like that's not, anyway, how would Bobby have Grace's home phone number and Daryl's home address? I agree. Daryl's home address, I don't know, I guess hypothetically maybe Grace gave it to him. They talked about his car, but I do think Grace very likely gave him her phone number off screen. It's not like we saw every second they were together. I mean, isn't that like when you meet, I, I don't really do the whole, but like if you meet, if you meet someone you're sexually attracted to at like a club, isn't the phone number one of the first things, or maybe it's right before you say goodbye to each other? I don't know. It's never been something I've done, but I I don't think it doesn't make sense. It's just, you know, like, we didn't see it, but, you know, she she wanted him to kill her husband for him. I think the the idea that he got her number so that they could... You know, especially considering that they, you know, she, he ends up saying no to it. But yeah, you know, I think it is a stretch to say that she also gave him Daryl's home address just in case he needed it. But I don't think it's a stretch that she gave him her number just off screen. So Jenny asks yeah i'm just gonna i'm just really briefly you like patsy klein i just love her i wonder how come she don't put out no more records because she's dead oh that's sad don't that make you sad i've had time to get over it she died in 1963 so 34 years before the film and Jenny says she's 16 years old, so Patsy Glam has been dead more than twice as long as Jenny has even been alive. That's, that really, you know, because the town is just stuck in the past. She has so little contact with the rest of the world that she doesn't even know that one of her favorite musicians has been dead for twice as long as she's even been alive herself. 
and Jake walks in on Bobby and Grace kissing and says, Grace. And she says, Jake, I thought you were in Phoenix. No shit you thought he was in Phoenix. The reason he's not is because he knew you would think he was, and he knows the kind of stuff you get up to when you think he's out of town. You know, that's, yeah. And, okay, so this is from Wikipedia, under casting. For the Toby and Tucker role, Joaquin Phoenix said small town style gave him the inspiration and the idea for the haircut, which was TNT, the character's initials, shaved on the back of his head. These kids in these small towns, these fads that just roll over them, he told Rough Cut magazine in October 1998. Like, five years passed and they still hung on to them. So I, so I thought it was really great if he shaves his name. He thinks he's really notorious. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so this is still Wikipedia. The film was nom nominated for two Golden Raspberry Awards. Worst director, which went to Kevin Costner for The Postman. And I've heard that one was bad. I haven't watched it. And worst supporting actor, John Voight, also for Most Wanted, ultimately lost to Dennis Rodman for Double Team. Yeah, that I... Oh boy, that movie and Dennis Rodman's performance. Yikes! That is like... Excuse me. That is that is a terrible. Like I said, I used to be a fan of Jean Claude Van Damme, so I watched Double Team, and wow, that that movie is terrible, and Dennis Rodman is terrible in it. Even Jean Claude can't make up for that. I could still sit down and watch like Time Cop, you know, but Double Team, I don't ever want to watch again. It was also included on Siskel and Ebert's Worst Films of 1997 episode. In the episode, Gene Siskel reflected that U-Turn had the same highly stylized violence as Stone's Nightmare Upon Killers without that film's intellectual content. U-Turn seems like Stone's attempt at a commercial hit, and he failed miserably. Right, and that brings us to the external reviews. Yeah, yeah. The stuff I got to via the external reviews section on IMDb. And, oh, wait, sorry. And there were 102, and I tried to copy in all of them, but I was only able to copy in 34 of them. So, yeah, the rest are dead links, other languages, you know, languages I don't speak, etc. And, let's see. Yeah, so this, I think this is Outlaw Vern's review. He says that, you know, the car breaks down in the middle of tiny desert town, hell. I, I really want to say, some people interpret it as John Voight was with Grace, and that's why he's now blind. You know, Jake didn't kill him, but he did blind him. And I feel like they, I could, I could kind of see how that might be, yeah. <clears throat> the car, he probably explains, is a 1964.5 Ford Mustang, and he has no choice but to leave it with weirdo mechanic Billy Bob Thornton, who is covered in dirt and wearing glasses worse than the ones he wore in A Simple Plan. This character makes me want to see Billy Bob play a Texas Chainsaw family member. Yes, 100%. Let's see. Yeah, the Bobby sees Grace on the street and offers to help her out with her new drapes, both literally and whatever. Yeah, and, and they almost get to that, and a guy walks in, he's her husband. Worse, he's Nick Nolte.
I suspect that a lot of Jake's weirdest moments were no tea specials. Like, was it in the script that he makes a determination about Bobby by wiping sweat off his face and tasting it? Or that he kisses him on the lips and announces, now you've tasted both of us. Or that he has an emotional breakdown scene where he cries, forgive me, into Jennifer Lopez's crotch. I'm guessing no. But even if they were, they sure cast the right guy to do the stuff. That stuff. The worst luck Bobby has is when he happens to be in a little grocery mart as is being robbed and they take his bag from him. Now, we've seen this before. This is a classic noir setup. If the bag of loot gets stolen, he has to get it back, right? No. What happens is the shopkeeper nails one of the thieves with a shotgun. It blasts right through the bag of money, ripping the bills to pieces and covering them in gore. You always see people losing their money in movies, but how often do you see the money getting ruined? This is a horrible little town. Dusty and hot with nothing to do and fucking TNT. He always thinks they're hitting on a girl and tries to fight you. The sheriff picks you up and gives you a ride, pretending to be friendly, but actually he's threatening you, first blood style. He casually drinks while he drives, doesn't care if you see it. The resident knows his place sucks, they dream of getting away. Claire Danes doesn't even know Bobby, but thinks she's gonna run away with him. Grace has a fantasy of being a bird so she can fly away, be free, go to Disney World. She tempts the sheriff with fantasies about starting a sporting goods store in Milwaukee. Makes Terrence Howard in fighting goals starting of starting at IHOPs in Glamours. <coughs> In the town's defense, I must point out that they have vending machines with Dr. Pepper in the glass bottle, and for only 25 cents. Also, I noticed there's a video store, so if you have air conditioning and VCR and a row of quarters, you might be in business. You know what's weird? This almost plays like a parody of Sean Penn's image to the people in the Fox News belt. He's an outspoken liberal, so they hate him, and doesn't help that he often comes up kind of humorless about it. So he can and has been criticized even for something as nonpartisan as taking a boat into a flood and rescuing people. Being one of this genera one of his generation's greatest actors just makes matters worse because that's kind of elitist. Besides, he threatens our way of life, making us have to try to describe why he hated Tree of Life. Bobby fits into that image because he's this smug outsider who comes into their small town wearing a fancy suit looks down on their simple ways of life, calls a hard-working mechanic an in ignorant, inbred, tumbleweed hick. He's a criminal, and worse, a tennis player. The leisure sport of the super-rich, the, the people in the town are cartoons, buffoons, dirty monsters, daughter rapists. They're how Sean Penn's critics think Sean Penn sees them. The content itself does get more and more feverish as it goes along. I love that when Bobby and Grace finally get some cash they've been scheming to steal, they spontaneously start fucking on top of it. This is with both the crow and the dead body still in the room. Let him watch. I want him to know what he's missing, Bobby says. Not referring to the crow, I don't think. Now, let's see. Okay, we're gradually getting through all the stuff that I've noted. Okay, so let's see. Sorry, dead air. Uh, let's see. I right that gets us to the IMDb user reviews, and I let's see. I think I just copied in the top hundred of them. I actually let me let me briefly check. I think there was oh that's right. There were two hundred twenty-eight. So I copied in all of them, and that's why there's so many. Okay. 
Several people comparing it to Red Rock West and yeah, some people who hate it because it has a lot of taboo material. I would have a problem. Okay, I'm sorry. This is. That's really funny. Anti-soda pop film and the third Jake. I don't agree with, you know, they, they only gave it 5 out of 10, so obviously we disagree about the quality of the movie. But that's, I like that. That's, yeah. Now, let's see. Now, hmm. I wanted to find a deeper level to the film. At times, I would think it was a permutation on some Greek myth. A trip to hell, a blind man who sees all, betrayal, rape. Or maybe there's an Apache le legend at the root of the film. You get allusions to that culture, but nothing more. Again, the book may have been able to spend longer in the sun than the camera crew and be the audience could. And let's see. Claire Danes, just the way she walks slash skips is a kick. I agree that it would be wrong for the movie to show all this taboo stuff if it was either making excuses for it or maybe like saying that it's not a big deal. But we're clearly supposed to laugh at how messed up it is. We're not supposed to leave the movie thinking that, you know, let, let's to just briefly, one of the most fucked up things about it is that Apparently, yes. Jake is not just the the Grace's stepfather, but her actual father. Like they share fifty percent DNA, and they've had sex for years, including before she was of age. Obviously, that's incredibly fucked up, and the movie isn't saying that it's not. You know, the, we're, I understand not, la you know, maybe you think it's too fucked up to laugh at. I can understand that. And I can, I can understand saying that it's wrong to put stuff like that in a movie. You know, um, it, you know, hypothetically, maybe someone will imitate it. Maybe, maybe someone will watch it and think that, May, and and they'll put the idea in their head, and they'll go out and try to do it. Obviously, that's fucked up. I just don't think that we should be. I, I if there's someone out there who might, you know, who if they watch this might try and have sex with a family member. I hope that there are people, you know, that that they have someone that they can, you know. That they could trust to help. If if they can't tell themselves that that's something you shouldn't do, that they have someone that they can talk to and say, you know, this is wrong, right? And they could and they would listen and say, you're right, that is wrong. You know, I don't think we should take 
things out of movies because there are some people who might, you know, get, yeah, who, who might take away from it that it's okay to do things like that or something. Now, yeah, I just briefly want to read. This person gave it a 1 out of 10, and their one-line summary is worse than awful. Shot, stabbed, burned, kicked, beaten, run over, thrown off a cliff. They should have called this the pen that wouldn't die. And, yeah, overall, they don't, you know, I don't, yeah, that's, that's a good way to sum it up, and that's funny. And, let's see. And I can understand, like, if movie, if a movie like this had been made, like, in the 60s, I think back then, they did have a, you know, they basically, they didn't show that much in movies that, that they thought you shouldn't be imitating. But, like, 1997, really? We're still not doing movies that have stuff that, no, it's some, you know, I, I think it, my, my, way of defending stuff like this being in a movie is that it helps people who have had, you know, some people have had very extreme experiences in their lives and something that then helps is to watch a comedy like this that has the, the, you know, the, the kind of thing, you know, where, because there are a lot of extreme things in this movie, but they're depicted in a way where you laugh at them rather than despair. And I think that's, you know, if, if you have had experiences that, that where you really, you need to laugh at something, you need to see something that's extreme, but where you can laugh at it, I think this is a, a good movie for that kind of thing, you know. Like I said, I showed it to my father and he loved it. He's experienced a lot of really awful things in his, his life. And, you know, he does also like much more, you know, comedies that aren't as as harsh as this. But, yeah, some of some movies he really loves are movies like this that... Yeah, you know, and, and I mean, he's known people who were like some of the people in this. So, yeah, it's it's cathartic. And I think that's, you know, I, that would be my argument in favor of movies like this being made and not being, like, banned and such. Like, I think, I, yeah, didn't I already say, I don't think you should watch this movie if you're not 18. You know, and at that point, I think you know some of the some of the negative reviews you read, and you just wish, like, if you just watched a trailer or read the MPAA warning for this, you would have known that it's not going to be your movie. And I don't, you know, I understand watching something, hating it, and then submitting a negative review. I've done that, you know. I try not to do it so much anymore, but you know, I can understand. Especially this. This is something that really, like, if you watch this and you're not laughing, then you probably hate the movie. If you don't find it funny, then you probably find it beyond disgusting. And that's that's the thing. Sometimes what one person finds hilarious, another person, you know, that, that doesn't so much happen if the, hilari if the hilarious thing is like, you know, witty wordplay, but if you're making people laugh at taboo, then obviously if you're not laughing, you're disgusted. You know, that's basically, there's not really a lot of in-between there. Yeah, you know, if you, if you just watch this and you're disgusted about it, and you really quickly write something out and submit it, I can understand, you know, maybe if you gave it some more time, maybe you'd end up being less intense about it, so I don't blame them. But I do feel like, I mean, it sounds like for a lot of these people, this was never a movie they were going to like. 
this was always going to be too extreme and shocking for them. And yeah, but I that is that those are all of my prepared notes, and I have been going for a long time now. Between this and I already did the video on WandaVision. I'm not sure which will be up first, though. But yeah, between the two... I've been going for four hours straight. So, yeah. I... Actually, yeah, just briefly. I think there's maybe more than, more than one cover for this. So I want to show you what this one looks like. Because... I, I quite like it. I think I bought it primarily, you know, I I saw this and I was like, I gotta see what the, you know. Yeah, and I think the, the tagline helped really sell it beyond that. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's not much on the, you know, the back of the cover. Yeah, you've got the three character shots, and that's basically it. Or, yeah, sorry, two character shots, and then the, you see them menu. That was that was that was a thing. They would put an image of the menu on the cover of the DVDs. Like, don't you want to buy this? Look at that menu. That's a that's a thing of beauty. That's, yeah. That was that was the thing back then. I'm not sure that people still sell DVDs based on the the menu you might see, but you know, yeah. I mean, 1997. It was it was a one of the first DVDs. So, which is also why the only thing that it, like a theatrical trailer and filmographies, and when it says filmographies, that's exactly like it's just the list of the movies they've been in. It's not like a write up about their their. Ah, what's it called? Their career and ups and downs and such. No, it's just, it says which movies they were in, but then I'm not sure IMDb existed when this came out on DVD. And I don't think YouTube did. So, you know, I mean, today you can just look up the trailer, although it is on better, it's in better quality on the DVD than I found on YouTube. Anyway, but yeah, that is everything. So I hope you enjoyed watching, as I definitely enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time.